house will come to order. <laughs> Representative Murphy. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I'd like to move that the House uh, may not be, excuse me. Hold on a moment. I'm a little rusty. I want to meet past midnight. How about that? So, Madam Speaker, I move that uh, we uh, waive Rule 1.50 so that the House is able to meet past midnight. Representative Murphy moves a waiver of Rule 1.5-ish. 5 1.50. <laughs> Representative Sanders. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would the Majority Leader yield for a question? She will. Representative Sanders. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Majority Leader Murphy, could you explain uh, why we need to meet past midnight? What are we going to be taking up if we were to waive this rule? Representative Murphy. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Sanders. Uh, there are conference committee reports to take up as well as the pensions bill, as well as other work of the people. And so I'd ask for your support. Representative Sanders. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, would the Majority Leader yield for another question? She will. Representative Sanders. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Majority Leader, we are under the, uh, I guess, uh, assumption or thinking that uh, perhaps we'd come back tonight, uh, maybe a few hours ago, uh, take up the bonding bill. Uh, are we still looking like we're going to be taking that up uh, this evening? Could you give us a little guidance on where we're at with that? Representative Murphy. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Sanders. It's my hope that we're taking up that bonding bill yet tonight or uh, very early tomorrow morning. Representative Murphy moves that we waive Rule 1.50. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. no. The motion prevails. Is it division? Conference Committee reports on House Files. Conference Committee report on House Files. This is the Murphy M. Motion. Conference Committee report on House File 1951, an act relating to retirement. The report is addressed to the Honorable Paul Thiessen, Speaker of the House, the Honorable Sandra L. Pappas, President of the Senate. We, the undersigned conferees for House File 1951, report that we have agreed upon the items in dispute and recommend as follows. The report signed by all five conferees on the part of the House and four or five conferees on the part of the Senate. Murphy M. moves that the report of the committee on, uh, Conference Committee on House File 1951 be adopted and that the bill be repassed as amended by conference. I recognize the author, Representative Murphy, to explain the report. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Past omnibus pension bills have been very important in assuring our pension funds long-term sustainability. Reforms in the 2010 resulted in six billion dollars of savings. Minnesota was one of the first states to make major reforms after the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Public safety plan reforms in 2013 resulted in one half billion more dollars in savings. This 2014 omnibus pension bill builds on the public pension reforms of the past four years, helping to continue improving stability and sustainability of Minnesota's public pension plans. This bill was crafted in the spirit of good financial stewardship and accountability to stakeholders, current and future public retirees, local government, and school district employers and taxpayers. Some of the most significant reforms in this year's bill includes raising employee and employer contribution rates for PERA and MSRS. And the PERA changes were made with the intent that they will help put these plans on the path to achieve 100% funding. 
merging the Duluth Teachers Retirement Fund Association into the statewide Teachers Retirement Association, which follows past practice and precedent in protecting members of the merging plan while holding TRA contributing members and school districts harmless. The teacher fund consolidation continues the longtime trend of consolidating standalone funds to stabilize them and make the big fund more sustainable. Extending aid to the St. Paul Teachers Retirement Fund Association and fixing an amortization date to help the plan achieve full funding. This bill takes a cautious, conservative approach to retiree cost of living increases, spelling out the process by which cost of living adjustments are triggered when the three statewide plans reach 90% funding. The plans must be 90% funded two years in a row before COLA increases kick in. We are clarifying eligibility requirements for the Public Employees Retirement Association and for the Correction Plan membership in the Minnesota State Retirement System. We are fixing the statutory joint and survivor optional annuity discount rate for all the statewide plans, which will reduce system costs and administration. The three statewide pension funds' financial status has improved significantly. The MSR general plan is 88% funded on a market value basis. PERA general is 78% funded and TRA is 77% funded. We are cautiously optimistic that the current market conditions will result in further improvements in the pension system's funding status. In the conference committee, there were five substantial differences between the House and the Senate, and they were quickly resolved. Well, several of them were quickly resolved. In the segment that Representative Dis um, O'Driscoll brought to us, um, for the annual min minimal, minimum salary threshold for public employees retirement association membership, we changed the term school district to school year employees. The second difference related to the amount of money that was going to be invested for the merger of the Duluth Teachers Retirement Fund into TRA. That number was 1437700. The House version had a million dollars more, but the compromise was the Senate number which was 14031000 plus the aid that carried over, which was the $346,000. The third difference was the matter of four dates that were necessary to accept the House position because the House position was the one that was adopted for the merger and the four dates of when the consolidation would begin and end are start in um, fiscal year 2015 and will be completed in 2016. 
The fourth difference was the Senate position. We accepted the Senate position on the St. Paul aid, the aid that would be given to the St. Paul uh, Retirement Association would start in fis fiscal year 2015. And the um, fifth difference was a um, compromise. It was the house, we took the house position, the house language, which provided for the estimation of the period for the use of a post retirement adjustment rate without specifics. But the plan directors are going to work with the Retirement Association, or the, uh, the Legislative Commission administrators, and work out more specific details of what should be contained in the um, report on the post-retirement changes. Those are the substantial changes. But our section three, we adopted all, all the similar positions in the articles one through 13, and all of article 14 except section three. Discussion to the motion to adopt the conference committee report. The member from Olmsted, Representative Benson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and uh, will um, Chairman Murphy uh, yield to a question? She will. Representative Benson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Chairman Murphy. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, we had quite a debate on, on one topic that I noticed there was a significant change uh, out of conference committee, and that, is, that has to do with the commissioner. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the merits of doing that, and I know there was a lot of arguments made on your side of the aisle when we tried to make sure that it wasn't included. I'm wondering what additional wisdom was brought to bear in the conference committee to change the bill to exclude uh, someone, quote, who was paying the full ride or the full boat to be uh, vested completely into the system. Representative Murphy. Madam Speaker, Representative Benson, the Commissioner asked to be removed from consideration very graciously. Representative Benson. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and, and uh, Chairman Murphy. I, I find it really pretty hard to believe since I sat through a couple of those commission hearings where he provided testimony on how much greater benefit he would uh, reap from being made whole and invest, completely vested in the system that he would just graciously come to the table and ask that he be removed from that. Uh, did he give any explanation? Would uh, Chairman Murphy yield for another question? She will yield. Representative Benson. So to my question. Representative Murphy. Madam Speaker, Representative Benson, he said that he had learned so much from attending our commission meetings in the last four months that this, this is my word, he didn't use that word, but he, he wants to become a retirement commission groupie. Um, he wants to continue his attendance at retirement fund, um, retirement commission meetings and continue learning the legislative process. He was, uh, he also said, I can count the votes. <laughs> Representative Benson. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and, and Chairman Murphy. I'm, I'm having a hard time swallowing that. Uh, I won't go any further than that, but to say uh, that's not the, the whole story that I heard, and I'll leave it at that. And uh, just to uh, members, uh, thankfully that it, it's out of there. Um, I, I'm just wondering how in the world we got, we got to that. I'm not sure that we heard all of the story, of course. But uh, Madam Chair, I'd ask that uh, would Chairman Murphy rise for another question? She will yield. Representative Benson. 
Well, Chairman Murphy, can you help me understand, and, and you probably remember these details, uh, and this is for the body. Uh, we just, in this, or in this um, bill, will now uh, be giving uh, the, the, for the uh, Duluth Teachers Fund to be folded into the TRA, we'll be giving them uh, $14.1 million, $14 million for uh, about 28 years. Are they still also going to get the $6 million that we approved last year? So, in fact, uh, this next year that they, they will be receiving $20 million? Representative Murphy. No, um, Representative Benson, they will be given the 1.031000 plus the $346,000 that they had that would carry forward. The $6 million was... Um, was for last year and this year. Representative Benson. Okay, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, well, one last. I mean, uh, I, I got up and I spoke quite a bit against this bill. I, it's it's going to pass off this floor tonight, I'm sure. Um, it is fraught with uh, major problems. I'm not going to go into every one, but uh, let's let's just talk one more one more question, if she would yield, Madam Chair. She will yield. Representative Benson. Well, um, Chairman Murphy, uh, although we're going to be giving uh, the St. Paul plan uh, $7 million until uh, 2042, or somewhere in that neighborhood of time period, I know it's a number of years, um, kind of help me understand. I mean, we, we had some conversation about what, we're, where, what direction we should go as a state and a pension commission. Um, but in fact, even if we pay them uh, a, an additional $7 million a year for uh, 25 more years, we pay out, uh, they pay out $103 million in benefits every year, but they only have contributions of $52 million. So even if you include that ad additional new monies, what rate would the uh, what rate would that fund have to earn in order to make up the difference in order for them to make up or to be because you you said in your opening statement that this was going to make them solvent to a hundred percent but I'm understanding trying to understand the math I know it's late it's midnight but I'm kind of wondering you know for the people of Minnesota we're going to be pumping a lot of money into the St. Paul plan how in the world they make up the difference between the amount of money they pay out, the money, amount of money that they bring in from the active participants, and the amount of money that we're going to be giving them in a stipend every year. Representative Murphy. The, the, the date that you gave was the, the fix to that there is a date certain because they had up to this time they've had a rolling ending date and that would continue to go into the future and into the future when they were making their actuarial assumptions and the rest of the question the amount of money and so forth is based on the actuarial assumptions and the report, actuarial reports but I think Representative Nelson can explain it a little bit better than I can. I yield to Representative Nelson, Madam Speaker. Um, I guess we don't yield. Representative Benson, I think for a more understandable answer, you should call on Representative Nelson. Representative Benson. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, he can rise if he'd like and try to explain it. But the fact is, they're 60% funded members. They're 60% funded. They're paying out $103 million uh, annually for benefits. Uh, they're taking in $52 million from active participants, and we're going to give them another seven. So we can try to do the math. I'm looking at. I know that right now, uh, you know, the, the fund is required to produce about an 8% return. That returns to 8.5%, I believe, which only makes it harder, by the way, members, not easier. Um, so we're, we're still a long way away from resolving the issues 
uh, with St. Paul members. Uh, we kicked the tan down the road. We, we didn't get to what we really should have, and that is beginning the conversation about looking at the whole whole issue with defined benefit without some kind of acknowledgement that all over the country, more and more pension plans are looking at a hybrid of a combination between defined benefit and defined contribution. And we continue to fail to see uh, the, the train wreck down the road uh, unless we begin to really take responsibility for that. F folks, as a retiree, we count on this money. So I don't stand up here to rail on or rail against. Uh, I'm looking for solutions that will really make a difference. And I think at least for a couple of these plans, all we did is just put a Band-Aid on it and send it down the road again without really delving in deep enough to find out what the problem is. Um, I'm going to be dead and gone before we even probably get to this 2042 uh, date for the, the Duluth. Uh, that's a whole other issue that we've already talked about. But members, uh, this is still a, a bad bill coming out of this uh, conference committee. And uh, I'd, I'd say a, a hearty no. Thank you. Representative Murphy. Madam Speaker, I, Representative Benson, thank you for your comments. Um, I think my understanding is that St. Paul is 68% funded. The member from Hennepin, Representative Kahn. Madam Speaker, and also in further an answer to Representative Benson's uh, question, question, as the person who authored the bill to allow the commissioner to change his pension benefits, uh, and as someone who uh, um, was disappointed by his withdrawal, although I fully understand the effect of counting the votes, I would like to point out that this was a very bad decision on the part of the Pension Commission. It was essentially, uh, it was essentially um, deciding to bow to the fact that this was a politician even though it violated something that we've consistently done in the past. I guess I'm the only member of the Pension Commission who was on it the summer that we spent an entire summer, a summer under the chair of the Pension Commission at that time, Representative Richard Jefferson, setting out the principles of the Pension Commission, which have served us very well in making decisions in that process. And going by the posi positions, the, uh, what the commissioner was asking us to do was perfectly correct. One of the most important parts of those positions is that we do not do that unless the person pays the full actuarial value. What was most offensive to me about this was that um, less than 10 years ago, this body and then the Senate and, uh, um, had voted in violation of the principles of the Pension Commission to award this kind of change and the full benefit to a former member of this body, um, then a former senator and then a former mayor of St. Paul by the name of, uh, of Randy Kelly. The difference was is that former Mayor Kelly who claimed that his, his problem was that he checked the wrong box. He checked the wrong box and signed the wrong, the wrong document. And, um, and, and he was excused from making the payment. So the state plan, the, the state plan which we're all members of, lost the money that he, either he or the city of St. Paul was, um, was to put in. Now there was an amendment brought on the House floor at that time, and you know it was, must have been a good amendment because the chief authors of the amendment were Kahn, Krinky, and Emmer. And the um, amendment would have forced the mayor to pay the actuarial costs rather than get it free. And it was overwhelmingly defeated so that he was left free 
to go free, and that was a real abuse of the process. So it shows that a politician who somehow has found favor with the body can get special, um, a special treatment, while someone who someone who doesn't have a connection with the body cannot, even though in the past we had allowed the same things that Commissioner Johnson asked for. Anyone is curious, I actually do have the vote here from 2006 with the members who are here. I will note that both Representative Murphy and I did vote on the right on the right side of that. And some of the people who have made very moralistic speeches about this at any time voted to allow um, uh, former Representative Kelly to get his full benefit without paying anything for it. So I am voting for the pension bill. It's a very good bill. I am disappointed that this part was taken out because not of serious political considerations but because of obscure political fears. The member from Wabasha, Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm wondering if uh, Representative Murphy would yield. She will yield. Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Murphy, when the bill went out, it had cost of living adjustments for the pension recipients in both the St. Paul and the Duluth teachers groups. Are those still in the bill? Are we still uh, increasing the amount of money we are paying out to the pension recipients while bailing them out? Representative Murphy. The Duluth teachers are going from zero to what TRA is, yes, so that they will be with the same cost of living. The uh, St. Paul, I, I think they're going to two. Down. Down? We did not change it from the way it went out. It was not a conversation at the conference committee. Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Murphy. Um, as I suspected, members, um, that part in the, in the bill did not change. So just as a refresher, members, the taxpayers of Minnesota are bailing out the Duluth teachers and the St. Paul teachers funds uh, because these insolvent funds are failing. And uh, in addition to the taxpayers of Minnesota, many which, I should remind you, uh, are paying the taxes that are being used to bail out these funds are individuals throughout our state who don't have pensions themselves or they may be losing their health insurance with their employers yet we are bailing out these pension plans and then we're giving them a raise on top of it to their pensions the people of Minnesota many of whom can't, don't even have pensions, even anything close to this. Many of the self-employed people have nothing like this. Many are losing their health insurance or don't have it. And we are forcing them to pay to bail out public pensions and then pay the people more. Members, do the people of Minnesota know what's going on here today? at 10 minutes after midnight. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Hennepin, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And members, there's a lot of hyperbole going on here. Um, that's, these are pension plans, are part of the contract, part of the wages that are paid. The pensions are wages that are deferred and paid back and it's an agreement that's been made with these with these members and these are part of the part of their working conditions and, and their salaries are going forward and this these these did not change coming off the floor as was said here the same and similars between the say the senate and the house were adopted except for the one provision which was taken out and yet they're beating up on the gentleman for trying to, to, to trying to, to, buy, to buy back his service credits. And that's what he was doing. He was trying to buy back his service credits. And the other 
change that were in here. It's actually going out with less money in it than it came. Um, actually, like $8 million less money than it came off the floor. So it's lower. We're spending less money on this pension bill than it came went off the floor originally. Members, I urge a green vote. Representative Murphy. Thank you. I'd like a roll call, Madam Chair. Representative Murphy. <laughs> Representative Murphy requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Is there any further discussion on adoption of the report? Representative Murphy. We have over 300,000 active public employees and 171,000 retirees, disabilities, and survivors that are dependent on the major public employee pension plans in Minnesota. Promises have been made and this bill has to be passed to make sure that promises are kept. Public employment accounts for over 10 percent of the state's entire workforce. What we do in the public sector is very important. Sometimes we pass laws that weaken Minnesota pension plans. Unintended consequences. When Minsky was formed, all the community colleges which had been and training college, the, the vocational schools, which had been part of the school districts in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Duluth, those teachers were put into TRA. The retired teachers continued to stay in the pension plans of Duluth, St. Paul, Minneapolis and they have lived, which is a good thing. But the pension plans are still paying for those retired teachers, whereas the money that active teachers put in now went from that day forward into TRA. The majority of money that are from Minnesota, that go into Minnesota pension plans are our investment returns. The Minnesota Board of Investments have the best record in the country or one of the top records in the country of their returns. Oh, an average of over 10 percent. Minnesota's investments are doing very well compared to many other states. One of the unintended consequences besides the, the laws that made the community college, the vocational schools, the uh, state college system in their merger and made future teachers the teachers then and the future teachers members of TRA another law was the charter schools that was passed by the state and a law was passed when we established charter schools in a very short time after the charter schools were established, charter school teachers were put into TRA, not the local school districts, pension funds in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Duluth. Duluth's population has decreased, school population has decreased over the years. 
Schools have closed. There are many fewer active teachers than there are retired teachers. Twelve years ago, it was flipped. There are twice as many active teachers, there were twice as many active teachers as they are today. Today, there are twice as many retired teachers as active teachers. That is not sustainable. This is probably personally for me one of the most difficult bills that I've ever carried. Because as somebody's brought up in the past, you are a teacher. And I, and when I was an active teacher and a union activist, we were so proud of having an independent pension system, a pen, an independent pension plan. We are going on, on our own. I remember when Minneapolis merged and Speaker Thiessen carried the bill for the Minneapolis teacher merger. And they never believed that that would have happened 20 years earlier. And I never believed. But last year, my union president came to my office with the president of the Duluth Teachers Retirement Fund and said, Mary, you have to help us. We have to, in order to keep the promises that were made to our retired teachers, we have to merged with TRA and we don't know how to start that process. And when we brought, we talked about it on that day and I couldn't believe. The statistics that they were showing. And we talked about what we were going to do about it. And the Pension Commission started talking about what they were going to do about it. And we met with the governor and said, what are we going to do about it? And the governor said, we have to have a study. What can TRA afford a merger? Can Duluth afford not having a merger? And we had the TRA and the Duluth teachers, some of the actuarials, people involved for, for the pl various plans, and the St. Paul teachers, and they went to work and did an actuarial study of the costs. Where is it? down here? Um, of the costs and the savings and the state aids that would be necessary and recommendations. And the study was completed and brought to the commission in January and February and March. The commission talked about these things. 
And in April, was it April? In April, the commission voted that Duluth should merge and that St. Paul should be given additional aid. And those two articles are in this bill. But there are 12 other articles that are in this bill too that affect all the public employees in this state. And affect all the, your rights, Representative Draskowski. Madam Speaker. They are. Madam Speaker, I'm having a hard time here. Can we? Representative Murphy. The taxpayers of the state. But do not forget that every public employee are taxpayers too. Your local school teachers, your local snowplow drivers, the people that clean the roads and plan the roads, All public employees pay Minnesota state property taxes and all the other taxes. And they serve all of us in whatever capacity that they are hired for. And they are good people and they are leaders in the community and they are little league coaches and they are your next door neighbors and probably a relative too. Promises have been made and promises should be kept. And if you vote green, they will say, thank you and how can I continue to serve you when you need their help? The clerk will take the roll on the motion to adopt. The clerk will close the roll. There being 79 ayes and 52 nays, the clerk will give the bill its third reading as amended by conference. The motion prevails. Third reading, House File 1951 as amended by conference. Third reading as amended by conference. Any further discussion on the bill? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll.
The clerk will close the roll. There being 79 ayes and 52 nays, the bill is repassed as amended by conference and its title agreed to. Conference committee reports on House files. Conference committee report, this is a Lane motion. Conference committee report on House file 2531, an act relating to campaign finance. The report is addressed to the Honorable Paul Thiessen, Speaker of the House, the Honorable Sandra L. Pappas, President of the Senate. We, the undersigned conferees for House file 2531, report that we've agreed upon the items in dispute and recommend as follows. The report is signed by, by, all, uh, by two of the three conferees on the part of the House and three of the, of the conferees on the part of the Senate. Lane moves that the report of the Conference Committee on House File 2531 be adopted that the bill be repassed as amended by conference. I recognize the author, Representative Lane, to explain the report. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is the it started off as a simple campaign finance board technical bill, passed the House 125 to zero. Then we went to conference committee, and the Senate added a piece to uh, set forth more detailed processes for the board to follow in conducting an investigation. There will now be three levels. They'll first have to do a prima facie determination. At face value, is this a frivolous or is this a real violation? And then they would move to uh, findings and cl conclusions as to whether there's probable cause exists for uh, a real uh, investigation. And at that point, there'll be a hearing of both parties, the complaint uh, party and the uh, subject of the investigation. And if that moves on and warrants an investigation, then they move into the full forced uh, investigation. There's an opportunity for the subject of the complaint to answer allegations and appear before the board before a finding is concluded. So this is a, uh, a very detailed process that is written into the statute for the board to follow. Because they added something new, we then added two um, provisions from the uh, House file 1961 uh, from Representative Halverson, two public integrity provisions. We have required the board now to audit or investigate compliance so that we really know um, on a random basis whether this is actually working. And uh, all the data relating to an audit, for instance, will be confidential. And the other piece has to do with adding another part to the statement of economic interest. If you are self-employed, your applicable business or professional activity would be reported the way it's reported on the IRS Schedule <coughs> C, the basic category code. It's very broad. If you've seen those core, uh, codes, it's uh, construction of buildings or manufacturing or information or real estate and rental and licensing or leasing or wholesale trade. Very broad categories, but that would be what would be reported if you're self-employed. Um, now, the let's see, the some other pieces were added related to board function, but I need to explain what the board, what the Senate also required to go along with their uh, processes for uh, moving through, through an investigation. They added expedited rulemaking. And I understand that that gives um, some sore spot to some people. So I want to just say a little bit about that. They insisted on this for their more detailed processes the board needs to follow. And uh, what we created was a bit of a hybrid between full real rulemaking and expedited. First of all, it's laid out in a very prescriptive way what the board has to do. This is substantially more details in statute as to what the board has to do than is usual for this process. And second, what the board is limited to is five things. They have five particular things like processes for initiating and overseeing an investigation and the party's rights and opportunities to be heard, things like this. Five specific things that they need to do, no more. And third, Senator Newman was a Republican on the conference committee and he dislikes exp expedited rulemaking so much so he added all the notification provisions from regular rulemaking. The board must keep us informed along the way just as they do in regular rulemaking. So 
Um, anywhere along the way, we can uh, do legislation to stop it or overturn it because we are amply notified. Oversight is ours. Um, so it's very, with this very clearly laid out process and um, with the not same notification provisions as regular rulemaking, I call this a hybrid expedited process. And the reason the Senate did this is they wanted it to apply to the, after this next election, they wanted it ready. They didn't want to wait till uh, um, the usual 18 months or more that it takes in normal uh, rulemaking. This will then form a backbone to having a clear investigative process so that anyone being investigated has full awareness of what the process is and has the proper opportunities to be heard before the board. Uh, this is a, a good thing to do. I know that some people have a problem with expedited rulemaking, but I hope that this hybrid form will be satisfactory. Please vote yes. The member from Hennepin, Representative Pepin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Will the author yield for some questions? She will yield. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Lane, this is, uh, as you mentioned, this is not the technical bill that we all voted for. There's a lot of changes in here. Uh, I'm not sure that they all went to the, the committees that they should have gone to. Um, I didn't get a chance to go through the whole, uh, the whole conference committee report, but I did have a, a few specific questions, if you've got it in front of you. This, um, so the, you talked about the prima facie determination. Why is that here now? What, what, what does it mean? Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That's part of the processes for an investigation. The first thing, instead of just um, the executive director determining whether it's a frivolous or a meaningful um, complaint, there first must be an actual prima facie determination, and they have a definition of prima facie determination adopted, so it's very formal, and so that you just can't uh, decide this is good, this is bad. It actually has to meet that prima facie determination that it is not frivolous, that at face value it actually appears to be a violation, and that's just the first step of three. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Lane, there seems to be more information on that in the in Subdivision 11 about violations and enforcements. And I was looking at it, and it looks like before the board could investigate it, now there's some language that says the board chair or another board member designated by the chair shall make a determination as to whether the complaint alleges a prima facie violation. My understanding is that the, the campaign finance board is made up of an equal number from, well, at least I think they can't be, no more than three can be of the same party. So presumably then the board chair is going to be of one party or the other. So I'm trying to figure out how this works. It looks like this is making it into a, a partisan process. Now I see that the, that if, the, if they don't like the determination, they can go and get a, a different board member to review it. But then the problem that, that I have with that is that on line 5.8 it says the chair may order that the prima facie determination for any complaint may be made by the full board. So it gives the chair a lot more power to determine which uh, complaints are valid and which ones aren't. And since this is, is a partisan board, I, this gives me some pause. So I'm wondering, did the campaign finance board come to you with this? Who decided this was a good idea? Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes, this is coming from the campaign finance board themselves. They're wanting to take a more formal operation, a more legal operation, than just simply having the executive director do it. Um, they are starting out that if somebody makes a complaint, it will be determined whether it's a, a, a at face value of a valid complaint by one person from the board. And then if, the, if they determined that it was frivolous, the complaint would, could come back a second time, and at that point, it would go to a person who was of the opposite party that's on the board. And if they determined that it was frivolous, it could actually come back a third time by the, as a complaint, and at that point it would be heard before the full board. So there's a very clear process as to how they determine how they even start an investigation. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Lane. It does seem like the campaign board has a, a clear idea. They've got, uh, you know, they met the way within 15 days, must do this and that. Where did they get this process from? Is this modeled after the administrative law judges, or where did they come from this? Did they go through the rulemaking process to determine what the best way to proceed was, or is this just something the board came up with? Or, or what, what gives them the ability to determine what the process should look like, or did they actually go through rulemaking to come up with this process? Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
This is the process that they want to go now into rulemaking. This is the process that uh, some lawyers on the board, I believe, um, determined that um, uh, would be a better way than what they've been doing. So they've established a very detailed process to go through. They actually wanted it to be the full board to determine whether it's a frivolous thing, but this is a volunteer board and that was too heavy handed. So then they decided that one, the, the chair or the chair could appoint somebody to, uh, to make that first determination and to put in three steps of actually doing that frivolous part. So they're, they're really extending and deepening the process before this can turn into a full fledged investigation. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I have a lot of problems with the board chair, which is a partisan person, being able to have so much power in making the decisions. And the, the other problem I have with this section is that there are you know, a certain number of days laid out, 15 days for this, 45 days for that, and I'm not really clear if that's based on what the administrative law judges do. I'm not sure where this – usually there are a lot, you know, some really formal processes that they can follow, and I, it just seems like when this is just sort of slipped into a conference committee report without any discussion about the process neither through the rulemaking process or even going through the government operations committee, that gives me uh, a, a lot of pause. So it sounds like they didn't necessarily have any process in mind. Uh, so that gives me some concern. I do have a, a few other specific questions. On line 2.18 and 2.19, I'm not sure I understand exactly what this sentence means because there's a double negative. It says, the executive director is not an ex officio member of the board. Now usually I think an ex officio member of the board can't vote. So if you're not an ex officio member of the board, does that mean you can vote then? Representative Lane. Madam Speaker, uh, this actually is something that I objected to because it's so unnatural. If a person's position makes them ex officio, it is stated in their role that they will be ex officio. You never say that somebody is not ex officio because if it's not labeled, they're not. But they are um, perturbed, shall we say, in, on the Senate side, and they wanted to make sure that the uh, executive director was uh, clearly not an ex officio member. So they insisted that this be here just to clarify. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Lane. Well, for me, it doesn't clarify anything because I'm not clear whether it means they can vote or that they can't vote. Do you, could you answer what, what, whether this – because I'm not, I, I'm not so thrilled with the idea of the executive director being able to vote, and I think that not, not the, the double negative makes it more confusing. Representative Lane. Um, Madam Speaker, actually I don't see a double negative. The executive director is not ex officio. Ex, ex officio would usually mean you could vote. He never did vote. He isn't uh, already. He never has voted. But this they just wanted to say he's not an ex officio. He's not a voting member. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't think that's accurate, but I want to ask some more questions go a little bit further. Online... Um, if you could go to the duty section, section 5, subdivision 8, it talks about on line 3.17, it says the board shall, shall only vote on a matter before the board at a meeting if, and then it lays out several things. I think these things might have been in the House version, and it says the matter was placed on an agenda distributed to all members of the board at least seven days before the meeting, and background was given at least seven days before the meeting. But then the line that troubles me is on 3.23, it says, by majority consent of all members of the board, the board may vote on a matter at a meeting that does not satisfy the requirements of this paragraph. So it looks like if four of the six members of the board decide that they want to bring up a meeting that night without having given that seven days notice, then they can, they can so vote on that. That's what I'm reading from it. Could you comment on that? Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, this is something the, the Senate uh, uh, was concerned about that they wanted to bring, I guess some of the board members wanted to bring more process to the board. In my opinion, that's the business of the board. It doesn't belong in statute, and that's what I encourage them to do. Just change your board processes. Don't have to write it into statute. But they wanted it clearly here that um, all things that would come before the board would be on an agenda seven days before. All the materials that involved with that agenda piece would be given to them seven days before. Um, and then they allowed themselves the flexibility that if a majority of the board 
did want to take up something other than was on the agenda, yes, they could vote then to, to take up uh, something else. It's, a, it's a, what they will, what's on their agenda. Representative Pepin. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker and Representative Lane. Well, I have some problems with that because I think that really could lead to shenanigans. I mean, that there should be seven days notice and, you should, and four of the six members, uh, which you know that three are going to be of one party. So if you have three of one party and then another person that has uh, an interest in that issue, you can shut the other two members out without giving them any notice whatsoever is what it reads to me. So I have some concerns with that section. And then, of course, the expedited rulemaking section. That always gives me pause for concern because that was not heard in government operations at all. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm curious why, if the Campaign Finance Board wanted this, why we didn't hear this in the Government Operations Committee. They could come before us and explain to us why expedited rulemaking is necessary. And um, maybe they didn't mention this too, but just a little bit more of the process. What, what is the process that they, you said that this is a hybrid process, so are they not following a rulemaking process right now, or what, what, is, what exactly is the change here? Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I do need to say that this was a request, this did go through the entire Senate process and was moved on the Senate floor. So it didn't, wasn't on our side because it was an interest of the Senate, and they brought this on their on their campaign finance technical bill. So that went through the entire process in the Senate. Um, your question had to relate to what to the, the expedited process is, how it's a hybrid. Well, because it's a very, very clear and detailed, it isn't make some rules. Because the campaign finance board does have the ability to do, do rulemaking within their own uh, purview. However, this is a, re a, a requirement by this statute, this uh, bill, to do specific rulemaking around five specific issues, and uh, it's very clearly laid out, as you can read in the bill, uh, how what they want to do. They want to have this prima facie, probable cause, investigation, all laid out. The days, the, the hours, the, I mean, the days that are allowed are all laid out in statute already, and then the board has a very limited purview of what to do with that, but they need to lay out the rules of how they will have their staff carry out the processes that are laid out right here in the bill. So it's a very narrow thing that they have to do in rulemaking, and they also need to follow all the usual notification processes of regular rulemaking, so that's why I call it a hybrid. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, Representative Lane. And I'm not, I, I'm not holding you accountable for all the things that the, the Senate does. Uh, nobody could do that here. But I do have some concerns with that rulemaking section because it's not just a simple little technical thing. It's, it is quite specific, but it's not, a, it's not a section that we've had any input as a legislature. And I think all of us have a real interest in doing that. They're setting forth the process. If you look at it, uh, members, I encourage you to look at, at that expedited rulemaking section starting on uh, the requirements starting in line 4.7 that they'll be able to go through. The process for the board initiating and overseeing an investigation, when summary proceedings may be available, dedication of staff resources. They're, they're going to do that for all of this stuff, and we've never had the opportunity to vet this in committee um, at all. And, it, and since this was supposed to be a technical bill, this is really frustrating that we would take this information uh, from the Senate. Um, there's some, also some data privacy things in here. Um, there's some information on, there, there's a section 12 that I did have a question for you, and I actually didn't even finish reading the whole conference committee report yet, but on section 12, subdivision 5, on line 8.32 and 8.33, it says, the board may send notice by certified mail to an individual or association that has not timely responded to the board's written request for reconciliation information, and then it talks about some fines, a filing fee of up to 25 per day. I guess that means if the... If your report isn't matching, if you got a check from a lobbyist and it's not matching up to the lobbyist report, then there would be a $25 fine per day up to a maximum fine of $1,000. I think it's good that they're looking at that and making sure that they match up. But my problem is that the board may send notice by certified mail. Well, certified mail is great, but we all go on vacation. So what happens if you go on vacation for three weeks and your only notice is by certified mail? Um, if you have a if, you're happy, if you have somebody staying there, maybe they'll get the, the, the letter, but why couldn't it be email or something like that? Because it seems like if there was email, then you'd have a, you know, you could do certified mail and email or some other certification process. I'm just worried that people aren't going to get the notice, and then all of a sudden they've got a $1,000 fine that they didn't even realize that. I know one time I had a, 
a check that I, I got a too big of a check and I had to send back part of the, the check and the, it was a little kind of a technical issue and um, it just seems like if you're on vacation or something it can be uh, problematic that you might not get your, you have your mail held or something and you might not get it. Could you maybe talk about the wisdom of that? Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, actually, this part that you're referring to in uh, Section 12, Subdivision 5, was in the original bill that went off the House, House floor. Um, this is because we required the Campaign Finance Board to do this reconciliation that you're talking about, and uh, they need to have a, a, a fine that makes people sit up and take notice. At the same time, um, another part that we added into this bill was for just exactly what you talked about. If you're out of town and you didn't get it and, and, and the fine is accumulating, you can actually have it in here that you can actually w have the fees waived if you can show just cause why you couldn't, done it, uh, couldn't have made it. So we put that in there very, very clearly that people can know that they can just explain their situation and as long as they continue to cooperate, cooperate the fees are waived. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Lane. I don't see that in here. It's pro I, I'll take your word for it. My, um, I still think that's a little silly that we wouldn't have just added that section in. And um, I do have uh, one other, I think my final question for you is I know that when, um, when we heard this bill before, we had several amendments, and uh, one of them was a, a limit on outstate and one on foreign travel using non-campaign expenses. We put some limits into travel and uh, we, both of those um, amendments went on and I, my understanding is they got taken out in the conference committee. Normally, of course, it's always the conferee's job to make sure you fight for the House position and I'm just wondering if you could just comment on why those provisions were taken out in conference committee. Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Actually, it was only one that made it in. It was only the foreign travel that made it in, and that one just fell off the fell off the wagon. It was not um, even. It was the last thing we did, and it was just left there. We did not add it in. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Lane. Well, members, this left being a technical bill. We all voted for it. I think I've shown many places where there's a lot of, a lot of changes. They're putting processes in place that haven't been vetted. Maybe they have in the Senate, but not in the House. Uh, I would really like to see more information in GovOps. I'm disappointed that we didn't perhaps hear a bill on these um, expedited rulemaking changes that the, the board wants. Got some real concerns about the, the the board chair having all this power. I've got um, other concerns in here that I've highlighted, and for these reasons, um, Madam Chair, I would move that we refuse to concur and send this bill back to the conference committee. And I would like a roll call. Representative Pepin moves that we refuse to concur and request a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Any discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the motion. The clerk will close the roll. There being 59 ayes and 73 nays, the motion does not prevail. We are back on the motion to adopt the conference committee report. Representative Lane. Madam Speaker, do we do a roll call for this? You may request a roll okay, call. Request a roll call. Representative Lane requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. The member from Scott, Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, would the Representative uh, Lane uh, yield to a couple questions? She will. Representative Albright. Representative Lane, uh, on page 7 of the conference report under subdivision 11, discusses data privacy related to electronic reporting systems. Um, it's new language, and there are a number of questions, and I'm just wondering if we could elaborate the rationale for introducing that into the bill. Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
This is uh, the uh, website storage. It's the beginning of the development of something to solve a problem that the Campaign Finance Board has right now. Um, if you are uh, submitting your uh, reports in by a Mac, it doesn't work. And you have to call in and get a personal help to, to make it work and get it through the system. And other programs that people use besides just uh, straight out Windows, it doesn't, it, it's not working. So they're trying to solve that problem because it's only going to get worse over time by having uh, a system, a, a database system where you can voluntarily submit your work into that system and then from that uh, upload it into the Campaign Finance Board. Um, they're just beginning to put it together and to, and to develop this to solve this problem and you don't have to participate. You can keep it on your own computer. When it's time to submit, you can submit it through that process. But if you wish to uh, be putting your information in over the year, little by little by little, <clears throat> you could use the convenience of that system and put it into that data storage system, and then at the point when you're ready to uh, file it, you can upload it into the da uh, database. Uh, the Campaign Finance Board has no access to that until you file it. Um, but and like I say, it's voluntary, and it's to solve a problem of having all these dis different systems work with their software. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. And would she continue to yield? She will yield. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we've had uh, other uh, assurances from other agencies that uh, the, the data that we submit to state agencies is, is confidential and, and private. What assurances or what safeguards are put on uh, this accessibility to the information uh, has been put into the language or what policies are you aware of that would prevent uh, such intrusions in the future as we've known in the recent past, if she would yield? Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, as I say, they're just beginning the process of looking at how they can develop this, and it'll take several years. But at that time, like I say, it will be voluntary. Um, if you don't feel comfortable using it, you don't need to use it. Um, yet they will do as, all the security details that they need to make this work right, and that's why they're taking these uh, few years to figure out how to do it, set it up, and, and maintain the security around it. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, would Representative Lane continue to yield? She will. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Lane, on page, um, I, I guess it would be section 16, uh, subdivision 10, it talks about board audits and the data classification. Once uh, the audit is uh, completed, what's the uh, protocol for disposition of the audit itself? Is that maintained? Is it delivered to someone? Uh, how long is it maintained after the disposition of the claim, if she would yield? Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Were you speaking to like 11.3? Representative Albright. Madam Speaker, yes, I am. Representative Lane. This just uh, clarifies that, and this is actually a part of um, Representative Halverson's bill that we added. This is a part where <clears throat> we state that the board must do audits um, and according to the resources available to them. And this is a part that goes with that that says all the data related to the audit, including the, even the existence of the audit, is confidential data and no one will disclose that information. Um, and at the end of it, only the final audit report will be public. All the rest of the data will be returned to the individual, and it will, um, it will not be kept by the board. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative uh, Lane, if she would yield, uh, what types of information uh, are going to be requested uh, from a claimant? Would this uh, go to the consideration of tax returns, of uh, personal information, W-4s, W-2s. Uh, what, what's the depth to which the information is going to be requested of uh, the person in, involved? Representative Lane. Well, Madam Speaker, thank you. Um, we should actually have Representative Halverson speak to this, but at the, I believe that, it, that they're going to do an audit 
of uh, any part that you have submitted into the, uh, into the uh, campaign finance board for something that you said is true, and they're going to audit you, they're going to have to find out whether you put in there was true, and they will have to, uh, they actually have subpoena power to get at any of the information to prove that what you have said is true. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, would Representative Halverson uh, yield for a question? She will, Representative Albright. Representative Halverson, based upon what uh, Representative Lane just uh, uh, answered, I'm wondering if you could either confirm, elaborate, or uh, expand on uh, what would be necessary and requested of a claimant to this system. Representative Halverson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Albright, I think uh, Representative Lane did an excellent job explaining it. We heard testimony from the Campaign Finance Board when we heard this in elections. We heard additional testimony in uh, the conference committee. The um, interest of the board in the audits is not to um, do extensive um, financial auditing or um, auditing of, of records beyond what is needed in order to um, prove what um, is said in a particular report is true. And these won't be triggered um, randomly. They'll be triggered by a particular um, uh, concern with regard to reporting. And uh, it's very clear that what the Campaign Finance Board is requesting with regard to any of our reporting um, is very clear. And so any backup documents that they would need would only go deep enough in order to uh, prove uh, what question they were trying to answer. And, and they were very clear about that. So they don't need detailed um, financial records. Um, they need, um, and, and, and uh, they, they were very specific in that they don't need detailed, uh, for instance, with uh, regard to personal assets, dollar amounts. It's with regard to whether or not you hold a particular asset that they need proof of. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm wondering if uh, Representative uh, Erdahl would uh, yield to a question. He will yield. Representative Albright. Representative Erdahl, in looking at the conference report, I notice uh, with uh, some curiosity that your signature is not uh, contained on the report itself, and I'm curious to know why. Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, members, and uh, while well, I enjoyed the, uh, the service uh, on the committee and the uh, dedication of uh, Representative Lane and the others on it, uh, I had some uh, problems that I expressed uh, a couple of times during the committee, uh, one dealing with the, uh, the expedited rulemaking that was included uh, by the Senate that has been discussed here tonight. Um, the goal of uh, Senator Newman, I believe, in working with this uh, was transparency, which is a good goal uh, with, in, in terms of the uh, elections board. But I felt that uh, expedited rulemaking uh, should have uh, had further hearings, should have gone to government operations uh, in the House. Uh, there were also some provisions that the Senate offered that I don't believe had gone through their committee structure at all. and. Uh, just were kind of included uh, as a you know, after after the process. So uh, I felt that uh, you know those changes, uh, the expedited rulemaking, uh, the the process, uh, particularly in regards to the Senate, uh, made it uh, a uh, a bill that I didn't wish to sign. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. And what Representative Lane. Uh, yield for one final question. She will yield. Representative Albright. Representative Lane, uh, the expedited uh, rulemaking authority, uh, I know that uh, Representative uh, Pepin also asked you this question, but I'll ask you again. It just it would appear that uh, the House language was, was much stronger. We adopted the Senate language in conference committee. I'm just very curious as to uh, the rationale for why that occurred and uh, why the necessary need for the expedited rulemaking? Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Our uh, House language didn't have anything about this uh, investigation uh, clarification as to how we, the Finance Board will do their audits and investigations, and so therefore we didn't have anything about rulemaking in our side. 
the Senate was very clear that they needed that, so we brought in uh, Representative Halverson's bill and laid that on the table in, uh, to get something back. Um, and that had gone through all our processes, but it hadn't been uh, gone through the House, uh, the Senate side. So it was uh, get something for what they insisted on, and um, we did that. Um, and I, I think I've explained that this uh, expedited rulemaking is actually a hybrid because uh, Senator Newman was very, he does not like expedited rulemaking and he needed to at least have it as close as he could make it um, by having the notification process in there all the way through. So the legislature is constantly notified of everything they do along the way and can constantly step in and, and, and change something. Um, so that's why I call it a hybrid, because it is in between the two processes. Um, they want it to be uh, effective in time for the end, uh, after the math of this next election cycle, so that people who are investigated will have a very clear process, will know what's going to happen, will be able to anticipate how long it will take, and uh, uh, when they will be able to have their hearing, and, and be, it be very clear for the person who is being investigated. They were very interested in having that taken care of. The member from Stearns, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would the author yield to a question, please? She will yield. Representative O'Driscoll. Representative Lane, a um, couple things for you. First of all, I was disappointed to hear that the uh, term that you used, that the foreign travel fell off the table, because that was a pretty big provision for me to be able to get on the, uh, the technical bill. So I, I think I'm going to be okay on that one, but I am disappointed that we didn't defend the House language on that. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to, um, to just pursue with you, and maybe Representative Halverson might be um, uh, another resource for us on this. Uh, about a week and a half ago, we had a bill on the floor that I asked to be tabled because we had some technical issues with it, and you were referring to that as the Halverson bill. I was wondering if you could tell me again the categories that we're using for the IRS codes. Is it the actual number or the general heading that might say construction and then I might be a person who's a finishing contractor or a carpenter and those different kinds of codes. Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It is just the large category, manufacturing, not the codes that come under it, under it. just the uh, oh, about a dozen here uh, major headings. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would the author yield to an additional question? She will. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Lane, um, was there language in the bill that would allow that to always follow the IRS code so as those changed and, and were modified um, by the IRS because of occupational um, changes or different professions that we would continue to mirror that? Or do we have to go back and fix that in statute each and every time there's a change? Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes. Representative O'Driscoll. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm not sure what yes means. Yes, we have to change it, or yes, we're covered. Could she uh, provide clarification for me? Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes, it will change as the codes change. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would uh, Representative Nelson yield to a question, please? He will yield. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Nelson, I have the uh, distinct pleasure of serving with you and, and other distinguished members of this body on the Government Operations Committee. Could you tell me and the members how important expedited rulemaking has been to the members of the Commission, or excuse me, to the members of the Government Operations Committee this year? Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, Representative O'Driscoll, I don't I don't know if you would, I would say that it's been important. I know when with the rules come up and bills come, came through government operations and there were rulemaking in there and di the different rulemaking processes, um, we took notice of that, but I don't know if we did how important expedi expedited rulemaking were. I know we had a rulemaking bill that we passed off the floor here, but has died in the Senate, so there will, that hasn't changed. That isn't being changed. The current expedited rulemaking process that's in law, it's when we 
in law say we're going to they can do expedited rulemaking. There's a process for that in law, and if there's objection to it, you need 100 signatures to to go to the full the regular rulemaking process. But it's when we designated that it's expedited rulemaking, which is what this bill is doing, and they're doing a little bit of a hybrid because they want us to get more notice from what I'm reading in this and. It's, so it's not just the not just the quicker expedited rulemaking, but giving more notice and giving more opportunity for us to say no, we don't like what you're doing, and make you go back to the full process. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would Representative Nelson yield to another question, please? He will, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Nelson, um, I'd like to just provide some clarification, maybe on my original question. Uh, we have heard a number of bills where agencies have been asking for exception to the standard rulemaking process and being able to be granted expediting rulemaking. Uh, the general consensus of members on the committee has been, hey, we're in favor of that, or hey, we're neutral to that, or we really have a problem with the exceptions that are coming forward. Could you maybe for the body's benefit talk about your experiences thus far this session with the, uh, the conversations of expedited rulemaking? Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, sort of what I said before is that you know, we've, we look at that and concern, and, the, and it's that the, the rulemaking process that we pick should fit the rule that it needs to be made. If it's a rule that we're saying that that telling them exactly how to do it, which is kind of what we're doing in this, that's falls into the expedited rulemaking process. If we're giving, if it's in a rule that they need to get done quickly, the DNR does that a lot where they ask for emergency rulemaking where they can, they get a faster process to do it. But we, you know, that's where it goes to government operations. We kind of decide which is the proper way to do it for the agency or the commission or whatever to what what is the proper process because that's why we have the different processes to give more public input or less public input. When you go to emergency rulemaking process, there's less public input. When you go for the normal rulemaking process, there's a lot of public input. And that's what we have to weigh in government operations and, and in the bills as they go forward of what process fits the, what pro rulemaking process fits the rules that need to be made. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would Representative Nelson yield to another question, please? He will yield. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Nelson, last year, the first year of the biennium, we also had a number of bills that talked about exception to the rulemaking process and expedited rulemaking. Do you have any recollection of um, my thoughts on that and what might have happened as a result in the interim that we, we might have done on this very topic? Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and during the interim, we did have an interim hearing on rulemaking because there was always a lot of questions on it and we had a lot of new members in the committee that hadn't been there before and didn't understand the rulemaking process and, and needed more insight into that including myself and so we did have a interim hearing where we had the come and explain how the rulemaking works and why it works the way it does and the different processes so that all the members could get a better understanding of it. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would Representative Nelson yield to one more question, please? He will. Representative O'Driscoll, one Thank more. You, Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, uh, Representative Nelson, from your experience in government operations being in both the majority and the minority, you know that that rulemaking is a very important procedure. Does it concern you in any way at all that the House has not had a chance to hear anything about elections rulemaking when the job of the campaign finance board is to do audits and investigations and will go ahead and promulgate rules in an expedited fashion without the House of Representatives government operations weighing in on that. Representative Nelson. Thank you Madam Speaker and members, Representative O'Driscoll. Um, if you're saying what I'd rather this this this, pro, this Part of the bill have come through us, probably yes, but as in all conference committee reports, when there are differences between the House and the Senate, and we've all, I think most of us have served on a conference committee, 
sometimes the Senate insists on language that they have goes in, and sometimes we get our, our way and our language goes in, and sometimes stuff that we pass doesn't go in. That's the nature of a conference committee and the compromises that go in during that. And um, so this is the typical process of how, how it goes through the rulemaking process, and sometimes things get in conference committee reports that we don't like, and sometimes we get stuff in there that the Senate doesn't like, and that's just the process. Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, I don't want to be uh, disingenuous when I said I had one more question, but he said something that led to another thought. Representative Nelson and Chair Nelson, you said that you, if you had your druthers, and that's my words, not yours, you'd like to have seen that come before the uh, Government Operations Committee. Question for you. Do you ever recall, Mr. Goldsmith, the Executive Director of the Campaign Finance Board, being before us or ever having a conversation with the Government Operations Committee as to whether or not we needed expedited rulemaking for the uh, Campaign Finance Board? Are you asking him to yield? Yes, Madam Speaker. Apparently he will. Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, um, I do remember Mr. Goldsmith being before us, but at this portion of the bill, this this rulemaking process was not a part of a bill that he was he was discussing at the time, so um, it never came up that I remember. Um, I'm getting a little foggy. It's getting late. In the, it's early in the morning, and I'm getting a little foggy, but I don't remember it. But like I said, this is the normal committee conference committee process. Things get in that comes from the Senate. Things get in that come from the House. We, we come with a compromise bill, and we, all, we always don't like it, but that's the nature of a conference committee. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I was wondering if um, Representative Simon, the chair of the Elections Committee, could yield to a question? He doesn't appear to be on the floor. Oh, look at, there he is. Representative Simon, will you yield? He will yield. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Simon, I have the utmost respect for you as a chair on the Elections Committee and Representative Lane and others who uh, we serve with. And we attempt to do things in a very bipartisan and very um, deliberative fashion so that we have good, solid public policy. Have, Chair Simon, do you ever recall in any of our committees or conversations with Mr. Goldsmith a request or a need or a desire by him to look at expedited rulemaking for the Campaign Finance Board? Representative Simon. Representative O'Driscoll, no, I don't recall that specifically. And although I wasn't a member of this conference committee, though I can understand why it's before us today. Obviously, it's a delicate balancing act that Representative Lane and others had to um, undertake. And you have not only um, bipartisan considerations, but bicameral considerations as well. And my understanding that some of what you're talking about was, ironically, something that Senate Republicans said that they had to have. As you know, you know, we have a, a, a requirement to at least seek out where we can bipartisan agreement. Uh, sometimes it's, um, uh, you know, Senate Republicans that might want something. Sometimes it's House Republicans, Senate Democrats, House Democrats. In this case, my understanding is that this was something that uh, this hybrid approach, uh, as Representative Lane uh, describes it, is something that Senate Republicans, um, at least through the voice of Senator Newman, wanted. So that accounts for what you're talking about. At least that's what I've been told. I was not on the conference committee, but I trust that those who were are, are relaying accurate information. Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Would Chair Simon yield to another question, please? He will yield. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Chair Simon, one of the things that I'm concerned about is I'm hearing a lot of concern from uh, members in this chamber that the rulemaking could become problematic for this. 125 to 0 passing on a technical bill with this provision coming back that could jeopardize solid bipartisan support for this. Um, and we know from our conversations, almost uh, every meeting that we've had with the Elections Board, or excuse me, with the Elections Committee, that we need to do things in a bipartisan way so that we can expect a governor's signature. And you are good about reminding us that that's the method that Governor Dayton wants to operate under, which is also the procedures that Governor Pawlenty operated under. I tend to agree wholeheartedly with you that that's an important process. Do you feel that if we don't get bipartisan support on this, or we did have 125 to zero, 
and where we saw um, a roll call that was rather divisive um, on the yeas and the nays, and Representative Lane has asked for a roll call on the adoption on this, which I tend to believe, but don't know for sure until the vote is done, that it may come the same way. We'll have two votes on this, plus a third vote on the final passage of this that may come down. Do you believe that that would send a message to the governor that we do not have bipartisan support and could jeopardize this? Representative Simon. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and Representative Driscoll. Well, I don't know if I'm, I, I want to get into the, the guessing game about what the governor will consider bipartisan or not. He's been understandably coy about what that means. I would be too, so would you if you were in his position. He doesn't give a number or a percentage. Um, but he seems to have a sense of what that is. I'm not quite sure what that is. Obviously, that's the goal here. But I, let me just take this opportunity to say that, you know, I would imagine that in the parallel debate that is going on or will shortly go on in the Senate, there are provisions that we have in the House that weren't in the Senate bill. Uh, and they may be things that Senate Republicans or Senate Democrats, for that matter, might uh, be uh, find surprising to be in this bill. For example, Representative Halverson's provisions, which are good government provisions which, which pass here, if memory serves, by a pretty bipartisan margin. So, um, you know, as you know, with these elections bills, because of the governor's um, a condition for bipartisanship, we have not only a bipartisan consideration, but bicameral bipartisan consideration. And though I understand and respect your concern with one aspect of many in this bill, um, it is something I'm led to believe that Senate Republicans actually said that they wanted. So I can understand the position of Representative Lane and her counterpart in the Senate in trying to you know, achieve that delicate balance. And as with many bills, not just election bills, there are things in here that, that either we want or that we were uh, not surprised by and things that we might not want so much and are surprised by. But at the end of the day, I think it was up to Representative Lane and others to try to achieve that balance. In my judgment, she's achieved it. Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. I guess I'll make a comment to the body at this point uh, on this matter. Um, Chair Simon had indicated that there are some provisions that were in Representative Halverson's bill that had passed off the floor. Uh, my recollection was that it did not pass with as strong a bipartisan support as we've seen other bills of this nature. Um, I had asked to have that bill tabled because we were looking for a, a fix, a very simple fix, that I'm glad to see, and that's why I asked Representative Lane what that correction was, because it was something that Representative Halverson and I were working on. This body, this chamber, had a chance to debate that position and that provision. And I support that in here because our body, our chamber, has had a chance to look at that. The part that I have a problem with is that I think a good bill is going to be uh, going bad, if you will, as a result of the expedited rulemaking provisions that are in here. And again, it's unfortunate that we're going to have a solid track record on this that says, I want a roll call, and we've got a very divisive vote. Now we've got a roll call again on the adoption, which I do believe is going to be divisive. And if those provisions of rulemaking stay in here, I believe that we're going to have a very divisive vote on this as well. And good public policy will be jettisoned potentially, depending upon what the governor's individual definition of bipartisan is, we still have time. We can send this back to conference committee and ask for this singular provision to be removed. And it is my hunch that we would end up with that 125 or so to nothing vote again coming off of this floor. It is one simple request to continue to make good public policy. I would hate to jeopardize good public policy by playing chicken with the governor as to what is and what is not solid bipartisan support. So members, I ask that we do not adopt this and that you vote against adoption and send it back to conference committee. It will be a quick conference committee, no question about it. I think we've laid the case tonight or this morning as to why we want to change that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Olmstead, Representative Benson. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And, um, I know it's late, but uh, I'm a little bit more curious than Representative O'Driscoll in terms of why we, we ripped off the piece about the uh, foreign travel. So, I'd, I'd, uh, Madam Speaker, would um, uh, Representative Lane uh, yield four questions? She will yield. Representative Benson. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Lane, I, it, this was one of those technical bills that left uh, this body uh, with 100% approval. 
And uh, I know that it took some work, and it was a good bipartisan effort. I know this particular part uh, of the bill that I mentioned was uh, O'Driscoll's, or Representative O'Driscoll's um, amendment. Uh, but I'm curious, um, you said uh, just a, f a few minutes ago, in fact, that uh, this is one of those provisions that just fell off the table. But it's my understanding, in fact, that even though there was no pushback or questions by the Senate regarding this uh, part of uh, the bill, that um, you took it out. And uh, I, I think it's a very common sense um, piece of legislation that, that adds some uh, transparency and some accountability. And uh, so I, if you could, please help me understand and the body understand why, with such a strong position, I don't know if it could be any stronger than 125 or 129 to nothing, why you would concede the portion of the bill that we came together as a body bipartisanly decide that this was important. Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I, we go through all these different things on the conference committee and we uh, give and take and uh, I just didn't have the votes to do this one. Representative Benson. Well, th well thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I, you know, I've been in conference committees, not any this year, of course, but um, and I know there's give and take, but what was asked for, what had to be given, and, and I, I, that's really not a great explanation why a bill that got 100% approval has such a level of modification in, in a conference committee when there's nobody asked for this and there wasn't any deal. I mean, you didn't have to trade this for, for anything. So, Madam Chair, I'd ask if, if she would yield for another question and just answer the, the few questions that I just had. Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Actually, uh, what we had on our bill, I believe everything except that one piece we got. And we had a lot of things from the Senate that we actually uh, modified. They came very heavy because I just need to clarify that um, this wasn't a request of the executive director of the Campaign Finance Board. This was a request of the Senate. They want clear processes of investigation. They want it laid out so they can anticipate exactly how the investigation will unfold and they want the person who is being investigated to have a clear understanding of the of the process that will be under, uh, undergone and that they will have the opportunity to be heard. This was the Senate who just absolutely um, wanted this and if they didn't get it the whole bill would die and as frankly as far as I was concerned that was fine. Um, and it was at that point that they were willing to take um, um, Representative Halverson's bill and uh, we then worked through the things that they brought in this, in this process of investigation and this process of expedited rulemaking and we insisted on changes in what they had brought. So, uh, because I felt that some of the processes that they had put in there were, were inappropriate, that they had gone too far. So it was fixing and changing and, and modifying, and um, I think we did a good job in getting almost everything we, we can, went in with. Representative Benson. Well, I guess, thank you, Madam Chair. I've, I've beat this one up enough, and uh, I'll probably sit down and let somebody else. Uh, I'm not sure that I got an answer to any of the questions that I asked. In fact, uh, good try. Uh, but what I didn't understand from what you said was, wow, we've got a strong position here. And, and then I heard something like, um, uh, we, I could have just sat down and gave up. And, and, and it was okay because they pushed back. Well, from my understanding, there wasn't any pushback at all on this piece uh, of legislation. And then it just dropped off the table because maybe... I know that we're not supposed to, to you know, call into question any motives here, but maybe suddenly a piece of Republican legislation that made this a bipartisan bill wasn't as important any longer. So I, I, I didn't get an answer, and uh, you know, I, I certainly, uh, you know, I was one of those that voted for the bill going out. I, I can't vote for it now as it's coming back in, for not just this reason, of course, but. That we've changed the technical bill so that it's not even close to what it was when it left the bill, uh, left this body. Thank you, Madam Chair. The member from Hennepin, Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Would Representative Halverson yield, please? She will yield. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Halverson, I understand that you served on the conference committee for this bill. And I'm wondering if you could look into Section 5 of the bill. 
And if you can kind of explain what your interpretation is of the new language that was added on section five, in particular line 25. Representative Halverson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm trying to, I kind of missed what you said there right at the end. Were you giving a line number, Representative? Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Halverson, can you tell me on the new language on line 25 what your interpretation is of that? Representative Halverson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So I heard line 25 and did not hear a page number. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm looking at section 5 of the bill. It's on page 3, line 25. Representative Halverson. Um, Madam Speaker, it is still unclear, and I'm getting some uh, assistance here uh, from around me. Uh, page 3, line 25, as far as I can see, is section 6 of the bill. Um, so I'm still not clear what is being asked. Representative Anderson. Um, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Halverson, I'm looking at the conference committee report. Do you have that in front of you? Madam Representative Chair, Anderson. And I, I apologize. It is line 23. My eyesight is failing me at this time of night. My apologies. And I can't read the counties on people's name tags either. Representative Halverson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, as Representative Lane stated earlier, um, the... Um, Senate requested that we, um, as conference conferees, put more direction to the board of what their processes should be with regard to agendas and board meetings. And this one um, provides that um, an exception to the requirement that they have to have everything on their agenda seven days before the meeting. In, in there's, if there's a majority of consent, the board may vote on a matter at a meeting that does not satisfy the requirements of this paragraph. So as with so many things in, in law, when we're putting in this much detail and procedure, um, there uh, is often a necessity to um, provide for exceptions, and the majority vote is this exception. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And if the Representative Halverson would please yield to another question. She will yield. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Halverson, can you explain to me how the public would be notified of the new change in the agenda item? Representative Halverson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The um, uh, Campaign Finance Board is... Uh, uh, is a uh, operates under all uh, open meeting laws with regard to the laws of the state of Minnesota. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and Representative Halverson. I would hope that they apply, comply with the open meeting laws. But can you tell me how would the public be notified if the board is making a decision that doesn't require the notice? Representative Halverson. Um, Madam Speaker and Representative uh, Anderson, um, the, the board would notify them, the public, in, in whatever other ways that they um, make notice to the public. We put, um, typically we did not have this level of detail of board um, agenda creation in statute. Typically that's a board policy and so it would fall under their board policies rather than state statutes, the notifications. Representative Anderson. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If Representative Halverson would continue to yield, please. She will. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Halverson. However, the bill here does not uh, actually require any public notice, Representative Halverson. So can you tell me how a person of the public would be able to track something when now we are giving the authority to the board to not even give notice to their own members? Representative Halverson. Um, M Madam Speaker and Representative um, Anderson, I suspect that there's more being read into this than, than actually exists. Um, this is a situation where the board policies aren't changing. Public notice is not changing based on state statutes. The way that members are being notified is, is being codified. Um, whether or not that's dramatically changing from board procedure is, is, is not clear to me. But this is a, simply a matter of the, the Senate wanted codified language with regard to the way the board um, creates its agendas, and it is now in the bill. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Halverson will continue to yield. She will. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Halverson, even if that were, why would we want to, why would we want to advocate that the board not give public notice? Why would we want to say to the board that you do not have to make the public aware of decisions that they're making? Not only that, in this language, we are giving the board the authority that if two members are missing, the remaining four members can vote on a measure that wasn't included in the seven day notice. Can you explain to me why we would do that? Representative Halverson. Uh, Madam Speaker and Representative Anderson, we are not doing that. Um, as I stated, the uh, board policies um, and uh, public meeting laws, uh, nothing changes with that regard. Um, this is simply a codification of the way the agendas are created by the board and communicated to board members. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. But Representative Halverson, as you just said a moment ago, there is confusion over this. And if there's confusion over this, this means that the people are not going to be notified. This means that it's left up to the interpretation of whoever controls the board at that time. So now we have a situation of a six-member board where four of those members can say, no, we're going to do it this way. And by the way, we're adding this little item onto the agenda without the public notice of seven days. I think it says pretty clear in the language that we have, at least on this part, that it says by majority consent all the, of the, all members of the board, so that's four out of the six, the board may vote on a matter at a meeting that does not satisfy the requirements of this paragraph. So that means seven day notice and all of those other provisions that are right above it. So why, why, what was the impetus of doing this? Other than now we're going to try and codify bad policy, if that truly was the case, we're going to put into law lack of transparency. Can you tell me what, what, how does this serve the public? How does this make the process of tracking the campaign finance board actions? How do we make that easier for the public to track? Representative Halverson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Anderson. Again, um, with regard to public notice, uh, nothing is changing with this bill. Um, the Campaign Finance Board has uh, always met in public as per the open meeting law and continues to communicate with the public in the same way. This bill does not change that. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, Representative Halverson, I, I would disagree with you on that. Um, I want to ask you then on the next uh, portion that I have some questions on, and that is regarding the auditing. Can you explain to me what the auditing uh, process would be? Representative Halverson. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Again, it would be helpful to have a line number because I believe audits are dealt with in this bill in several places. Mm -hmm. Representative Anderson. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm talking about every place that it's located in the bill, Representative Halverson. So if you can explain to me for the Campaign Finance Board, what is their intent with the auditing provision? Can you explain that to me, please? Representative Halverson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Al uh, Anderson. Um, well, let me go ahead and start with line. Page 3, line 27, um, as Representative Lane ex explained in her um, presentation of the bill, um, we, uh, and as we actually heard on the House floor when my original bill was presented, these audits and investigations have always been ongoing with the Campaign Finance Board. Um, we take the permissive language and turn it into a must so that it is a um, priority for the Campaign Finance Board to audit the information that is put forward by public officials. Um, they, uh, audits are, are and have been um, part of the uh, investigation process when it's deemed necessary, when there's something in reports that um, may seem uh, off according to the Campaign Finance Board's testimony or if there is an outside uh, report or question that is raised um, then uh, something can be questioned, interviews can be conducted and if it raises itself to the level of the need for an audit or investigation um, it, is, it is undertaken by the Campaign Finance Board. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Halverson, did they describe on uh, what other audits they might perform? Are they looking to expand their auditing to be beyond that where someone maybe complained about uh, a report or a, a staff member noticed something off about a campaign finance report? Are they going to go beyond that and just randomly select uh, campaign finance reports to audit or candidates to audit. Representative Halverson. Thank you, Madam Chair. As I stated, um, the Campaign Finance Board has always had the power to pro uh, conduct audits and investigations, and they do so and will continue to do so when a question arises that is raised to the level of the need for an audit or an investigation or an outside report is made that rises to the need for an audit or investigation. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Halverson, can you point to the section in the bill where it says that language that you just said right there? Do we have language in here that bans the Campaign Finance Board from randomly selecting a candidate's uh, account from being audited outside of seeing something wrong with the report or somebody complaining about a report? Representative Anderson. Representative Halverson. Sorry, it's like ping pong. I'm just not keeping up. Um, Madam Speaker, Representative Anderson, the um, audit uh, provisions with regard to the processes for the Campaign Finance Board are part of the Campaign Finance Board's um, rules. It's not um, in direct statute, that direction. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and Representative Halverson. So just to be clear, there is nothing in this bill or in current statute then that would prohibit the Campaign Finance Board from randomly auditing campaigns for whatever reason outside of there being a problem or glitch and identified by either staff or uh, uh, outside complaint. So you're saying that there is nothing in this language that doesn't that prohibits them from becoming the IRS or anything to that extent. Is that correct? Representative Halverson. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker, Representative Anderson. I believe that we are all aware that the part of the job of the Campaign Finance Board is to ensure compliance with our very um, high level of campaign finance laws and with um, respect to uh, our conflict of interest and, and other provisions that are provided for within this chapter of law. And so um, their power to audit and investigate and subpoena has, has always been a part of the role of the Campaign Finance Board and this um, piece of law will um, have that continue as they have been operating. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Halverson, there's another section of the bill I'd like to ask you some questions on. And I am looking at Section 7 of the bill. And can you tell me what was the, the logic or the rationale behind giving the sole prima facie uh, uh, authority to the board chair? Representative Halverson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I would appreciate a line number and a page number, please. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It's section seven of the conference committee report. That's on page four. So you can just look at the whole section there. Representative Halverson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, again, this, uh, as Representative Lane has stated, this um, part of the uh, bill um, was uh, determined by the Senate that uh, the, the um, board as a whole did not have to uh, make the prima facie determination, but that the uh, executive director had the authority to do that. And that's... That's kind of the way they did it. <laughs> Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and or, Madam Speaker. Uh, did I hear you correct, Representative Halverson? You say, you're saying now that it's the executive director? Representative Halverson. Um, Madam Speaker, I, I guess I misspoke, and it would be very helpful if uh, Representative Anderson could point to a specific line number um, that she is uh, addressing, because she clearly is looking at some very specific language, and it would be helpful to have that line number. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It's the entire section seven of the bill, and as I mentioned earlier, that's on page four of the conference committee report. So if you get a chance, if you can just kind of look through that whole section, it's right in there for you. And in particular, I have a couple more questions for Representative Halverson. Representative Halverson, so we are, is there a reason why the board chair would have this complete authority when there is, uh, we have set up the entire board. We have both uh, Republicans and Democrats serving on the board. Why is it that we would give this sole power to one individual? Are you, you explain asking the rationale, please? And I, yes, I am asking her to yield. Thank you. Representative Halverson will yield. Representative Hal Halverson. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I think that um, Representative Anderson might be a little confused as she talks about the amount of power that we're giving a particular member of a board or a board chair with regard to this section. And um, this is an initial, dis, uh, initial finding and a, a finding that um, is brought to the entire board to say, do we move forward with this investigation? This is a board of, as we know, volunteers. Many people come from all over the state to volunteer on this board. And so we definitely want to um, be sure that when we gather this board, and we um, are, the taxpayers are paying uh, meeting charges or travel charges that we are gathering them to do um, really important work. And so uh, this is an initial step 
uh, in a process that, as you can see, as you read the bill, which I know you've read carefully, is is um, laid out in in numerous steps, and that that the board does get involved, and uh, it, it is very clear what the roles of each member of the board are to be. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. If Representative Halverson would yield, please. She will yield. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Halverson, can you point to the page and line where it says the entire board does the prima facie, please? Representative Halverson. Um, rep uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative um, Anderson, um, as I said, this is one step in a, a long process that is laid out throughout this section, so I don't believe that um, I referenced a particular um, line. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Halverson, I must have been mistaken. You said that the entire board is up to making this decision. And as I read through this Section 7, I'm not seeing anywhere where the board is actually making the prima facie. It is actually made up by the board chair or the person that they designate. Now, if there is another line that I'm missing here, um, feel free to let me know. That's the, that's the question that I'm asking you is can you tell me where in the bill it says that the entire board is making the decision on the prima facie versus just the board chair or the person they designate? She will yield. Representative Halverson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And again, I did not um, say that the entire board makes the prima facie determination. I said this is a step in a process in which the entire board gets involved at the appropriate times. Representative Anderson. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Halverson, back to my original question then. Why is it that we're giving sole power to the board chair then or to the person that they designate to say whether a complaint is going to move forward? And yes, if you would yield to that question, please. She won't yield. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Halverson, when you go to a conference committee, we as an entire House body rely on you to go to that conference committee and to represent the House. You have now come back with a conference committee report that you signed on behalf of this entire body that completely changed the bill. In fact, what you did is you just took the Senate language and you dumped all the House language. So can you explain to me why you decided to chuck all the House language, sign that conference committee report. And I'm asking you these questions because you're on this conference committee. If you would please yield. She will not yield. You could ask somebody else your question. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So as I'm supposed to understand then, as a conference committee appointee, you don't want to answer the questions of this body that we have as you go and represent us as a body? I think I'm just asking some basic questions here. I have grave concerns about this section because what we are doing is we are saying one person is going to determine whether a complaint goes forward. And as we all know, the Campaign Finance Board is made up of Democrats and Republicans. So imagine if you put up a complaint and the chair happened to be a Republican, and that Republican board member said this is not, doesn't meet prima facie, and so that gets tossed out, how is that going to make you feel? Are you going to feel frustrated with the process? Is this going to give us due process for the public, that they're going to have the opportunity to rightfully have their complaints heard? Or is this going to draw more concern about how politics is run here in the state of Minnesota. I would argue that we are making this worse for our state. We have a situation now where board chair in a partisan representation board that they are going to be making these decisions willy-nilly 
and then we have really not a whole lot of recourse. Can you tell me what the recourse is, Representative Halverson? What's the recourse if that board chair doesn't find prima facie for that person? What happens to that complaint? Where do they go next? Can you explain that, please? Are you asking her to yield? She will yield. Representative Halverson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I certainly heard a lot um, in, in that question. And, and first and foremost, um, with regard to the process of conference committees, and I think this has been mentioned a few times tonight, that um, we certainly have to deal with a lot of give and take when it comes to bills that come to a, a conference committee from two separate bodies um, with uh, various... Uh, party interests, various regional interests, various um, interests from our respective bodies. And um, we bring a spirit of compromise, we bring a spirit of cooperation, and um, our chair worked tirelessly to ensure that we had cooperation. With regard to the section that you were um, asking about, and I, I think it might be worth um, just rereading how the complaint process is being codified here. Um, there are very specific steps that are being codified and that there are, um, as we like to say, on-ramps and off-ramps everywhere. Um, we know that frivolous complaints are filed. We know that there are times that um, and the board has worked very well um, with people and has, they have a policy to help people resolve questions, concerns, mistakes, because um, with regard to campaigns in particular, a lot of people are, you know, are volunteers and working out of the goodness of their heart. Um, many candidates are first time candidates or might be facing a, an issue for the first time. And so the campaign finance board works very hard to um, sort out what might be mistake, what might be correctable, and what might be an egregious act. And uh, these steps, as, as they're being codified, are to uh, make it very clear what the process is going to be. And so by making the process very clear, um, it appears to me that we uh, strengthen the relationship that the public is able to have with the campaign finance board because the steps are clear. The on-ramps, the off-ramps are clear. The ability for complaints to be made are clear. The ability for people to connect with the campaign finance board via the open meeting laws are clear. Um, and it's a very public process. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. But Representative Halverson, you didn't answer my core question. The core question of, we have a board that is made up of Republicans and Democrats, and it's with the idea of making sure that when somebody makes a, files a complaint, that they have solace that it's the entire board, that there's not going to be partisan politics at play when we go to the campaign finance board. But here now, we are giving sole power to one individual rather than all of the members of the board, we're giving the power to one individual to say whether a, a complaint moves on or not. And I can't find a, there is not a single person in here that is gonna question when their complaint gets uh, thrown out or their com a complaint gets uh, moved ahead on, against them that they're gonna question, well, was this really because there was cause or is this partisan politics? Instead of upholding the integrity of our campaign finance board, we now are taking that away. And we are putting question about whether there are going to be partisan politics in play for the campaign finance board. And I got to tell you, they do a pretty darn good job, but you now are putting a smudge on their reputation, a question as to whether or not this is going to be a legitimate concerns that are addressed either through the complaint process, either for a complaint that moves forward or doesn't move forward. And so as a conference committee member, and as to you, Representative Lane, this clearly did not meet the threshold of not having controversy. 
You had one of your conferees not even sign off on the report. Now, you started off really well. 125 members of this body, both Republicans and Democrats, 125 to zero, right? 125 to zero said your bill was good. You should have said to the Senate, we don't need to take any of your language. Because you know what? We've got it all taken care of here. Right? I can't imagine any negotiations where you could not have a stronger position, where you go to the Senate and you say, hey, it was a clean slate here. I don't need to accept any language that you have. I'm taking this. Let's go with it. It's good, clean. Bill, let's bring it back. Be done. Zip, zip. That's how it should have run. Instead, now we're adding question into our campaign finance board about whether it's going to be a partisan board. We're not going to be able to rely and trust on this board anymore. And plus, we had earlier in the bill public notification. Even if that was their practice in the past, it's wrong. We're now going to say that it's okay for the board not to have notification, that we're going to wipe out a seven-day notice. I can't imagine a single board, if we were to do that here at the legislature, if we were to come up and say, oh, by the way, ways and means, we're going to just tack on this bill right now. Oh, wait a second, maybe we do that a couple of times. I've probably seen it this year. But seriously, is that how we're going to operate? We're going to condone that, that that's an okay thing to do? And there's so many questions within this bill. We came with a bill that was 125 to zero. That's all you needed to pass. And instead, we've got a bill that is going to have a guarantee split. And I just think that's really unfortunate when you could have just had a home run on this bill. Members, I strongly encourage you, if case you didn't know, I strongly encourage you to vote no on this. This is poorly done. We should send this thing back because you could come back with a victory. And I know, Representative Lane, your heart's in the right place. I truly do believe that. But this was not the right approach. And I, I feel bad that the Senate treated you this way and that you've got this language in here because we could have had a home run, real, home run with this bill without this language. Members, please vote no. Further discussion to adoption of the conference committee report. Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We've had some interesting things said here. And just because a person stands on the floor and says things doesn't mean they're true. A lot of things have been said here pointing to this and why not this and why not that. And the answer is very clear. This is to make the campaign finance board's investigation very clear, very easy for a person who is having an investigation against them know exactly what is going to happen and how it's going to happen. This is very good policy for how we have investigations happen. It cleans things up, you might say. This is what the Senate wanted to achieve. And I will clarify around this frivolous part. When a complaint comes in, the first thing to do, is this frivolous? Somebody didn't do such and such. You have to investigate. And it's not anything to a value. It's just frivolous. It only takes one person to look at that and make that determination. Well, by virtue of being one person, they are possibly going to be on one side of the party, one political party, so that the person who has submitted that complaint has an opportunity to come back a second time and say, I really mean, I really mean it. I want you to I look at this complaint. At that point, another person on the board looks at it to see if it's frivolous. And that person, that second person, has to come from the opposite party. Now that person can say it's frivolous, and the complainant can come back a third time and say, I really think this is serious and not frivolous. At that point, the entire board gathers from wherever they come from, has a, a volunteer uh, board comes together for a meeting to say, is this frivolous or not? So there is a very clear process just simply to determine the first step, is this frivolous? And then if it is real and not frivolous, they do the probable cause to see if there's a, a probable cause for an investigation. That's the second step. And then the third step is the full investigation. This is a very clear process. It is more detailed and better for us than it was before. 
and this is what they will now make rules around to make it detailed and make it work out and it is a good bill it is an addition to our bill that the Senate put in there from all their processes it is a good bill and I have heard from your side that some people think this is a good bill they just don't like the expedited rulemaking ideologically in fact um, perhaps senators uh, representative Sanders will yield for a question he will no, no, <laughs> no, okay. he will yield okay. representative Lane um, I was just wondering if you thought that the bulk of this bill was was basically good representative Sanders well, thank you, Madam Speaker. I guess, should I walk through the bulk of the bill to, uh, I guess we'll take it provision by provision. Uh, kidding aside, look, I think this bill started out um, fine. Um, I think there were some good provisions in there when it left the House floor. I think we lost some of those good provisions in conference committee. And I think the expedited rule uh, making authority is a big problem, especially on uh, audits and investigations, which are the most important things that the campaign finance board does is investigate and audit the new power that we gave them and, and we want to give them expedited rulemaking authority so what if it takes them a little longer let's make sure they get it right members that's why this should have never been added into the conference committee report and I would ask for a red vote there being no further discussion the clerk will take the roll on the adoption The clerk will close the roll. There being 70 ayes and 62 nays, the motion prevails. The clerk will give the bill its third reading as amended by conference. Third reading, House File 2531, as amended by conference. Third reading as amended by conference. Discussion. Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the bill.
The clerk will close the roll. There being 70 ayes and 61 nays, the bill is repassed as amended by conference and its title agreed to. The uh, next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 2490. The clerk will report the bill. House File 2490, the second engrossment, an act relating to capital investments. Uh, Representative Hausman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Um, uh, the primary amendment is the, uh, the one that passed out of Ways and Means and Rules and we uh, now adopt a secondary amend uh, amendment, which the, is the agreement after that point uh, before we move ahead. Okay. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk report the amendment. Houseman moving to amend the House File 2490 to second engrossment as follows. Delete everything, everything after the enacting clause and insert. The amendment is coded DE7. There is uh, also an amendment to the amendment. The clerk report the amendment. Houseman moving to amend their amendment uh, to the House File 2490 as follows. The amendment is coded A43. So this is to get the bill in the shape the author would like it. Uh, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. And on the amendment, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. Representative Hausman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members, and for your patience. And I will try to be quick, and yet the, the bill does require just a, a little bit of comment. And even though it is a late hour, we also require words of thanks uh, to Speaker Thiessen, to Representative Doubt, to Representative Dean, all the capital investment members 
who toured the state 16 days and nights of touring, 120 site visits, another 90 additional presentations, and almost 3,000 miles logged. Um, very, very grateful to capital investment members. And of course, staff, partisan and nonpartisan. Deborah Fastner, my uh, legislative assistant, and Jenny Nash, the committee administrator, the fiscal analyst, Andrew Lee, the uh, partisan, the partisan staff, Gabby Sujan and Andy Pomeroy. Uh, we have a House researcher for higher ed, Matt Gehring. And I pause on Deb Dyson, uh, a brilliant wordsmith. And what would we do without people like this? At all hours, we give them an impossible job, and they do it brilliantly. A reporter asked me today, he said, how late are you keeping up the staff up? And I said, well, that's not the end of the story. We keep them up late, and then we tell them to go home to sleep and come back at 5 AM. And that is what uh, people like Deb Dyson have done for us. The reviser, Jeff Case, and our page, Max Hall. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Members, um, we can lose focus when a bill like this goes through the various stages. And we begin to think of those things that we lose along the way in negotiation or as we cut the bill. But a letter this week refocused my thinking, and this letter is for you as well. It's a thanks to you as well. I just wanted to thank everyone for their efforts on putting together the bonding bill. It is an amazing list of projects that will touch literally every facet of our state and the lives of many, many people in innumerable pos positive ways. While not everything was able to be done under the constraints that were imposed, a lot of good things are being done, and in the end, our state will be better for it. That was someone watching our work who just wanted to weigh in near the end of this time. And there are a, a lot of good things, many of them a backlog from previous vetoes, at least 20. 17 of the Min, uh, Min, Minsky building projects on the current list have been before the legislature prior to this session in 2008, 2010, 2012. The WIF priority list has 69 projects. The clean water and drinking water priority list has 698, a huge backlog. The backlog for port development assistance, 25.6 million. So a backlog indeed. The uh, bill is filled with lines that leverage other money. Federal money, local money, private money. In uh, the Bowser area rim, after the enactment of the farm, federal farm bill, there is again federal money that is matched in military affairs, in, in PFA, uh, or in areas like the Southwest Regional Sports Center where the Schwann Food Company has donated 12.3 acres of land for the sports center. So much federal, local, and private money that is uh, leveraged. Members, I'm going to uh, speak to both bills. There is a general obligation bonding bill and a cash because the spreadsheet you have has both of them. And to save time, we'll just uh, s uh, talk through that uh, very quickly, uh, but uh, not repeat it the second time around. And so a word about um, University of Minnesota. They have given us a list of what that heaper money will go for. And it goes to all of the campuses. I see projects on the Twin Cities campuses, the UMD campus, University of Minnesota Morris, the University of Minnesota Crookston, and then research and outreach centers around the state. So University of Minnesota, heaper money that goes everywhere. Uh, one line that you might uh, want some information on, and that is the Research Laboratory Improvement Fund. Uh, the two parts of this we funded uh, were the laboratory that will uh, contain uh, the bee research that is nationally and internationally recognized, and the aquatic invasive species research on the St. Paul campus. And so those are funded. Under Minskew, uh, at the beginning of the, uh, the, the session, I introduced a larger bill, listed all of the Minskew projects, because I really thought this year we should fund them all because of that backlog. But many people said we never do them all, and that's the, uh, I think, the, the challenge we have, that, uh, they, that they fall further and further behind. I believe you had uh, 
delivered to your desks, and I don't know if it's been distributed, uh, the Heaper list for uh, Minsky campuses. Um, if that, I don't know if the front desk has distributed that or, or not, but uh, yes, it is, it's, it is on your desks. Uh, the 42.5 million in university, or in Minsky funds projects at 28 of our 31 institutions, 29 of 54 campuses. A lot of high priorities on those. Uh, you see most of them by name. That last line indicates that many other campuses have smaller projects, so you don't quite see them all uh, mentioned. But um, I think there are some 50-some campuses that uh, receive some of the asset preservation. Uh, the one I want to specifically give mention to in the Minsky list is the Education Village at Winona State University. We in the House had that at a much higher uh, level. Uh, we tried to hang on to that for a long time. We thought we should be more aggressive about this. This will be designed with integrated, flexible, and state-of-the-art learning and teaching space to lead the country in teacher preparation. And we can certainly be proud of that. Under um, DNR, on the second page, uh, you will note that flood hazard mitigation you're going to see in two bills, so there will be part of it in the GO bill and part in uh, the uh, general fund. Uh, trails people uh, work very hard in their communities. We fund a significant number of trails in this bill all around the state. I'll read some of them later. Those trails and all that planning come right out of the community. All the work is done on a grassroots level. And on many of these trails, the people in those communities have been working for a decade. They have been waiting. There have been line item vetoes on trails. There have been years when we didn't fund trails. So we have honored the work of many, many communities by forwarding these trails. Um, under uh, Bowser, the Board of Water and Soil Resources, I must make mention of RIM. I always, every uh, cycle, start with a very large number. It's met with a very small number in the Senate, and we have to figure out how we do something about this because we always end up with less than we wish, especially because it leverages uh, federal money and is so uh, desired across the state. You will notice under administration, we have finally put that very large amount for the capital, um, $126 uh, million. Certainly valuable and part of our obligation, but it does make uh, the bill much harder to write because it takes such capacity. Um, if you would note under, on page four of six, uh, Department of Human Services, and you see the broad impact that this area has. You notice the Minnesota Security Hospital, the largest amount. Um, so we see the, the spread of DHS services from St. Peter to St. Louis County and from the security hospital to early childhood learning facilities. Broad, broad impact in that area. Under the Department of Corrections, I must make mention of the Shakopee Perimeter Fence because we have uh, not funded this for many years and there was some opposition in the community for a while, uh, but this year they did have at least one escape that, uh, that perhaps changed uh, people's minds. But I have to show you, uh, it's the only stop on our trip where we got a haiku written just for the stop. And so they gave us this little white picket fence because surrounding the Shakopee uh, Women's Prison is a hedge about this high. And that is all that has, uh, has surrounded it. And so they wrote a haiku for us. Only female joint, no secure perimeter, need fence, not a hedge. That's the uh, creativity of the Department of Corrections for us. Um, under uh, the Employment and Economic Development, I want to call attention to the fact that the Children's Museum is in, in again, both GO and, and General Fund, uh, so if you see it on one and not the other, you might think it's been dramatically cut, but it has not. 
And then, of course, under the Public Facilities Authority, the project that we have spent an enormous amount of time this session and, and particularly in the last few days, and that is the Lewis and Cl uh, Clark Regional Water System. A project that um, I've been involved in uh, for probably longer than many of the legislators who represent that area. I, st I started first with Andy Steensma as they came in to my office and told about the problem and told about the multi-state solution that would be required. And at the time, they said our state portion would be 5.8 million, which we did quickly. And then they waited in vain for federal funding to come, and that has not been forthcoming. And so the solution that accompanies this this year is not in this bill, but you will see it in the tax bill to actually accomplish the entire project so that that region can be assured that that, that entire project will go forward. And I'm sure there are a couple of members who will uh, speak more fully to that. And finally, on the last page of the spreadsheet, there are some stalwarts up there in the gallery who stuck with us all these many hours for, for housing. 100 million in housing, 20 million public housing, and 80 million in housing infrastructure. 35 of us on this floor are co-authors of this bill. But when I speak to this, I have to uh, begin by giving tribute to those advocates who spoke with one strong voice all over the state with a single message. Working together, sticking together, they accomplished a great thing. They taught us something that, that we should remember. If you work together and stick together, you really can accomplish great things. And it was a lesson learned. We thank them for it. I want to just, um, uh, there's so much to say about this, I will just uh, mention two. I usually, usually use them in most of my speeches because I hope they get repeated over and over. One is the University of Minnesota research that tracked children. And what they found is that when uh, children had reached fifth grade and had been homeless or highly mobile, they achieved at the level of a second grader who was in stable housing, the contribution of homelessness to academic achievement. In the state of Utah, they determined that it was going to be less expensive for them as a state to simply house people than to pay for the cost of homelessness. And they set out to end homelessness and in seven years cut homelessness 78, eight years they cut it 78%. So I, I may have been slightly off on that. Um, it is a huge part of the bill, unprecedented, and thanks go to that vast majority. There are uh, people gathered in the gallery. They represent thousands all across the state. Thank you very much. I want to just um, reference um, a couple of pages in, uh, in the language. Uh, this is on the primary, the primary amendment on page 69. There's conveyance of some property, uh, the Harambe and crosswinds, that was an issue last year. All of the issues have been worked out and that conveyance finally happens in this bill. And then the city of Bayport has a conveyance that's important to them. This was in the lands bill, in the Erickson lands bill, and we moved it to this because we are conveying state bond funded property and so that requires 81 votes uh, to do. The other language to reference is in the secondary agreement because the trails are so strongly supported. I thought it would be helpful to simply call them out. And so on page 15 of that secondary amendment, the trails, Blazing Star Trail, Camp Ripley Veterans Trail, the Cuyuna Lakes Trail, the Gateway Trail, Gitchigami, the Glacial Lakes Trail, Goodhue Pioneer Trail, the Heartland Trail, Loose Line Trail, Mill Towns Trail, Minnesota River Trail between Mankato and St. Peter, and then um, the Minnesota Valley Trail from the Bloomington Ferry Bridge to the Minnesota Valley Wildlife Refuge, I'm told 
That will be, when this is completed, the highest used trail in the state. And I suspect for a lot of people will in fact be their commuter route um, that they will use. And finally, uh, the Shooting Star Trail from Rose Creek to Austin. Just two references to um, language. Um, members, I think, just because of the hour, I will not say much more than that, um, and uh, I'll, I'll just reference on the cash bill one other additional reference. Members, we uh, are going to do some quick procedural stuff because I moved a little bit too fast for this bill. So, Representative Murphy. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker. So, I'd like to move to reconsider the amendment, the DE7. We're going to move to reconsider the adoption of the amendment. All those in favor of that say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. Representative and, Murphy. Mr. Speaker, I move that we reconsider the amendment A43. So the reconsideration of the uh, amendment to the amendment. All those in favor of that say aye. aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. Okay. Do you want to do? Okay. And Mr. Speaker, then I move to suspend the rules uh, so that we're able to proceed with the, um, the uh, bonding bill. So we're going to uh, move to suspend or waive rule 3.33 for the purposes of this uh, amendment to the amendment. Represent out. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd encourage members to support that motion. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. Now we're on the amendment to the amendment. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. And then on the adoption of the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. Clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 2490 as amended. Third reading. Any discussion on the bill? Representative Wills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative Hausman, for all the work that you've put into this. And I want to commend leadership on both sides of the aisle and also uh, in both bodies for working together to, uh, to come to a bill that uh, most of us can agree to. And I wanted to uh, speak specifically on a project that is actually lacking in the bill. Um, and so I have a couple of handouts that I wanted to reference. And I know the hour is late, so I'll try to be brief for you. Um, the handout that talks about the Dakota County Technical College, um, it outlines their request of $7.5 million. And their request uh, was also in Governor Dayton's recommendation and was originally in the uh, bonding bill and was pulled out, I believe, yesterday. And as I looked at um, the priority ranking that Minsky provided for us, which is uh, something we're supposed to follow as, as we're looking at uh, funding these projects. And that's the other handout that I have for you. Um, you can see that the projects that have the, um, the plus signs are projects that were included in the final language. And the projects that are circled are ones that were skipped over. Uh, and my concern, members, is that we were, or I should say, uh, um, I wasn't part of the negotiations, but those negotiating uh, the uh, language and, and coming to a final agreement uh, deviated from the, uh, the ranking that was provided to us by Minsky. And my concern is that uh, projects that were further down in the ranking uh, were included, and, and yet uh, the Dakota County Technical College was not included, and it's uh, number 13 there on the ranking. And uh, you can see, if you look on the back side, that even a um, project that's ranked number 22 was included in the bill. And I'm very disappointed that this project was not included in the uh, bonding bill. Uh, it's phase two of uh, doing a restoration and um, 
improvement of the transportation and the emerging technologies um, wing in the uh, school. And the uh, Dakota County Technical College does an excellent job of educating and training uh, future uh, employees and, and workers in some very critical fields. Uh, they're very excellent jobs, high paying jobs, and, and I think that is, um, that that is something that is worthy of, of a bonding, um, of bonding funding. And so I wanted to make sure that members were aware of this project and uh, how important it is and, and how it, it should have been included in the final bonding bill. And while I'm very, um, very glad that there was 12 million for the zoo, uh, you all know how much I've advocated for the Minnesota Zoo um, in my first term here. Uh, unfortunately, with uh, the Dakota County Technical College not being included in the bonding bill, I cannot support the bill. Thank you, members. Representative Ward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, members, I rise in support of uh, the bonding bill, and I want to thank Chair Hausman and all the members of the committee, Representative Dean, and all the folks that worked on this, and all the people that traveled with us throughout the state of Minnesota to see the projects. It, re it really does make a difference, members, when you sit on the bonding committee and travel throughout the state and see the projects. And um, so, you know, members, I just want to emphasize, re-emphasize one of the things that uh, Chair Hausman uh, also brought to us. And, you know, a, not, a lot of these projects that are in this bill have been projects that have been uh, vetoed in the past, uh, have been there for a few years. And I just want to emphasize and talk about the trails for just a minute. You know, um, trails in particular have shown to be a great economic tool uh, for our uh, for our state and for our area, in particular up in central Minnesota. And a trail uh, like the Kuna Lakes Trail that has provided uh, and the mountain biking trail and the Cuyahoga Rec area has provided so much economic development and, and uh, tourism dollars uh, to the state of Minnesota, to our area, and created jobs. And then also, uh, you know, like uh, uh, the uh, Camp Ripley Veteran State Trail that, uh, you know, um, our, our former uh, colleague, uh, Representative Doty, uh, introduced uh, back in 2010 and then uh, was uh, line item vetoed and, and, and uh, he got the trail through, but it was line item vetoed and uh, that trail is in particular uh, particular importance to our area, it'll be the co most continuous, once it's all completed, it'll be the conti longest continuous trail in the U.S. And so that particular trail is of importance to our tourism and economic industry uh, that was uh, first introduced by uh, Representative Doty and now we're bringing it to fruition. And so, you know, uh, uh, members, uh, those trails are very, very important for economic development in our in our state and in our areas in the in, all over in the corner, every corner of the state. And, and Representative Hausman, you put together a good, balanced statewide bill and I uh, really appreciate your efforts. Thank you very much. I urge a green vote on House File 2490. Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and members, and uh, I would like to uh, thank all those who, who worked so hard putting this together, and uh, particularly those that that I worked some with, uh, uh, Chair Hausman, uh, Representative Dowd, Representative Dean. Uh, I would just like to say that uh, bonding bills, uh, by their nature, have many good things in them, and some things that we may find objectionable. In my mind, the good, particularly the restoration of the capital, which is essential to be completed and is in this bill, uh, far outweighs anything that I might object to, and I will be voting green on this bill. Further discussion? Representative Hausman? Uh, just in closing, members, I, I want to acknowledge uh, the disappointment of Representative Wills and probably others on this floor. Uh, we, we started with four billion in requests, and we are now down to a billion, and so we have said no to so many. Every day we lost projects. I can tell you uh, the day that I zeroed out Como Zoo, uh, which you know is near and dear, and which is near and dear to two million people a year who visit there, including many children, but we zeroed that out. My seatmate. Uh, who sits right here. We zeroed him out. He lost his project. Uh, so um, every day uh, in, in a process like this, uh, when a House and Senate bill come together, often the bill is larger after that process. It couldn't be this year because of that, the handshake deal last year. And so we had to accommodate House and Senate 
and uh, in the last days some additional requests from uh, House Minority and of course the governor and doing that every time we did it some uh, bills fell by the wayside so I acknowledge the disappointment of Representative Wills and so many others who uh, wish that their project had been fully funded uh, or was in the bill at all but um, members I would appreciate a green vote. Representative Drzkowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, if the if the uh, author would yield, she will. Representative Drzkowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Representative Hausman, how much money does the bill borrow? The um, uh, the geo bonding bill. Uh, the target was 846 million uh, general obligation bonds, and then we'll later deal with the cash bill, which is 200. Representative Drzkowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If Representative Hausman would continue to yield. She will. Representative Drzkowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, well, I'm looking at the spreadsheet, Representative Hausman, and uh, uh, it, it appears to me that there's $893 million that the bill borrows, of which the GO bonds is a subset. Is, am I reading that properly? Representative Hausman. Uh, members, I did forget to mention uh, a number of pages. There are a significant number of cancellations in the bill that I should have referenced. I moved so quickly. Uh, we try uh, every cycle to go back and see is there unspent money because if we can find some unspent money from years past that for some reason hasn't canceled. Sometimes there's just a small balance. I know Representative Nornis had, uh, had his folks check out theirs. Was it legitimate? MMB looked very carefully. So any unspent that we could possibly cancel, we did, uh, because that allowed us to do just a little more uh, to reach that 846. So I think that's what you're seeing. Representative Driscowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would uh, Representative Hausman yield again? She will. Representative Drzkowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you, Representative Hausman. Um, but I'm looking at um, the spreadsheet. I'm looking at line 263 on the spreadsheet. It says the total amount borrowed is $893 million. And then I'm looking at line 256 on the spreadsheet. The user finance at $39 million. Uh, the transportation fund at $36 million. The maximum effort school loan at 5.5 million, and line 260, the trunk highway fund appears to borrow about 8 million dollars. Um, are those also borrowing, Representative Hausman? Representative Hausman. Uh, Mr. Speaker and members, um, yes, on the Minsky projects uh, and University of Minnesota projects, all of those have traditionally uh, been two-thirds uh, state funding and one-third. Uh, the, the campus or the uh, system does it and that's that's the user financing piece of it that's the traditional uh, funding for higher education and what you see if you just follow the math down yes there there are a couple of trunk highway projects in here um, and but that's what the user financing is but if you look at the total and then you look on line 268 that's where you see the cancellations where we eventually get to 846 Representative Drzkowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, well, Representative Hausman, as I read the spreadsheet, we're borrowing $893 million. That's what I understand uh, as, as I read this, and I think that might be what you said, but I'm not sure. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Representative Hausman, continue to yield. She will. Representative Drzkowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so, Representative Hausman, what happened to the Bell Museum? How are, uh, how is that, to, what's, uh, where, where's the Bell Museum? Representative Hausman. Uh, Mr. Speaker, members, that uh, was one of those projects that as we moved along, it just became more difficult uh, to, uh, uh, to accommodate in a general obligation uh, bonding bill. Um, I believe that when the um, supplemental bill comes up, you will hear about that project again, but it no longer is in this, it is no longer in this bill. Representative Skalski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Maybe I'll, um, we can discuss it when we come with the um, the other spending bill uh, that comes forward. But, um, Mr. Speaker, thank you, members. Um, again, I, as I read this, uh, members, it looks like 893 million dollars is the size of the bill, um, and I 
understood we were going to be looking at 846 um, in borrowing in the bill. But uh, anyway, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Cornish. Uh, Mr. Speaker, members, I'll make this real quick. Uh, Representative Hausman, thank you much for the bonding bill. I plan on voting green. Uh, but there is one thing you know that I've been concerned with, and I've spoke to Representative Johnson about it. just one, one over quick. It's a security problem at uh, uh, the St. Peter State Hospital. The security guards there say it's a bad situation and getting worse, and they're not getting any help. Uh, the message for DHS was if, if you're working on it, nobody knows that you're working on it. The uh, message to the union would be please step up and uh, deal with DHS on the security problem. For the past few months I've been going over statistics on incident logs, homeland security logs, OSHA logs, and the St. Peter security guards have one of the highest assault rates in the country for a facility like this. And they think, the, some of those people think that NAMI and some of the mental illness advocates are half the problem because they're terming these people there that are violent and mentally ill as vulnerable adults and hands off. They can't use tasers or restraints. They would like to be licensed to a higher degree where they could use tasers and restraints and protect themselves. Right now they feel helpless. If they're assaulted, the client jumps back, puts his hands up and said, oh, it was just a bad episode and they're forgiven and it goes on to the next assault. So something has to be done to protect those good workers there that are suffering these assaults and I'm hoping that you and, and Representative Johnson will work with me in putting the pressure on DHS and, uh, and see if we can get this turned around and, and get some protection for those folks. So I wish I could have gotten my amendment on, but thank you for your work, Representative Hosman. Representative Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, I, since the subject of the security hospital came up, I'd like to give my view from District 19 air where this uh, is cited. Um, when I started the campaign uh, last fall, you know, or January passed, you'll remember I, I came in a special election and I attended a, uh, the first, I announced for election. And that very same day, I attended a legislative forum held by uh, my predecessor, Representative Morrow. And actually, Representative Woodard was there as well in St. Peter. And Representative Morrow made a really strong case that day that the security hospital is a moral imperative, that we absolutely this building has to be rebuilt to make sure we can assure a safe facility. He also made a strong case that it's a statewide project. And ever since I was elected, I've really delved into this subject a lot because it's an important place in, in, my, in my district. And frankly, I think for all of us, this is an important facility in, in, for Minnesota. And that statewide project, I want to thank, for, thank you, Representative Houseman, and everybody involved for assuring that we have full funding to build a safer facility. It's, a, it's essential to provide effective care for the patients who are there. And also, it's, a, it's, it's, it's essential to provide safety for patients and workers, our state employees, who protect and care for the patients. I want you to know that there's new AFSCME leadership at St. Peter's State Hospital, at the, at the Regional Treatment Center. And that my observation is that that new leadership, along with clinical staff and along with the management at, at, Saint, at, the, at the security hospital, are really working thoughtfully and hard to address the security issues or the safety issues that Representative uh, Cornish had, uh, mentioned. I think the whole state knows there's ser serious safety issues there, and those groups of people who are deeply involved with it understand that better than anybody. In fact, they had a long meet and confer today, and they were working on the safety issues. But I shared with uh, uh, union leadership, I also sh shared with management that we are, as a legislature are watching, and they know that we are committed uh, uh, to genuine progress on the issue of safety and expect to see tangible and significant progress by next session. But let's not lose sight of the fact that tonight this facility is critically important. All concerned with safety, all concerned with effective care, including NAMI at, at, at the security hospital, are, are in agreement that reconstruction of the hospital is critical to providing a safer environment for patients and workers. So it's by voting for funding to reconstruct the security hospital that we can take a major step to improve care for our patients and safety for our patients and safety for the people who protect and care for them. So I ask that everybody vote yes on this bill. Thank you. Representative Dean.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I would like to uh, thank Representative Hausman, especially, and the staff uh, for the Capital Investment Committee, both the uh, partisan and nonpartisan majority and minority staff uh, who work very, very hard on this difficult bill, and all of the committee members on both sides of the aisle uh, that uh, participated in the uh, travels across the state. If you haven't been on the bonding committee before, uh, it's a quite a trip. And I would highly recommend that you uh, put your name on the request for capital investment down the road. Uh, you learn a lot about the state traveling around. You learn that uh, when you go down to southwest Minnesota and Rock County, uh, it looks a lot different than it does in Lake County. And uh, they have a lot of different needs uh, than we do here in Hennepin and Ramsey County. You learn a lot about the state. You also learn a lot about the people who represent all the different corners of the state. And you realize when you travel around that uh, we probably do a whole lot better job representing our districts uh, once you get to see the districts and who represents them and uh, the uh, branch that uh, they sit on in this uh, big tree uh, that we uh, that we represent those districts. and. Uh, so I thank Representative Hausman for all of the hard work and uh, for the members who, who uh, traveled around. Representative Carlson, I believe, has the best attendance record on the uh, trips and uh, is always early to every single stop and uh, keeps it on, on, on track. Um, also, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, the why this bill is a little bit different. Uh, we all got one of these in our desks. And the Constitution of the state requires that this bill is a little bit different from other bills and that it requires a supermajority of 81 votes uh, to pass. And in most years around here, that requires folks from both sides of the aisle. And that uh, attracted quite a bit of extra attention this year, as you might as you might have, uh, might have heard in the last few days. And I think that that's something to pay attention to and just as a, a perhaps a warning for moving forward, we're kind of moving away from that. Uh, we reference the appropriation bonds that we're moving things from the Capital Investment Committee to other committees where you don't require a supermajority vote, you just require a simple majority for an appropriation bond. The best example of that this year was with the Senate office building uh, that we require only a simple majority to pass all of that $90 million that we're now just borrowing on another credit card. And that's, I think, a bad a step in the wrong direction uh, to moving things from this bill. And we can, by just a simple majority, decide to not have a supermajority according to uh, the court decision this year. And I think that's a step in the wrong direction uh, from the intent of the Constitution. People who put this thing together said that it should be harder for us to do this, to borrow this kind of money, to put the state's obligation, to put state taxpayers and, in fact, the full faith and credit of the state of Minnesota on the hook should be harder. Uh, so that we're moving away from that, and I think that that's something to pay attention to and also to be wary of in the future uh, as we do this. You know, down the road we might, we might just say, why even have a bonding bill? If we can simply build a building and rent it from ourselves, whether it be the Senate or whether it be the DNR or whether it be some other agency, uh, are we moving away from the, the bonding bill and... Uh, in this tradition that we have and the constitutional obligation for a supermajority. So I think that that's something to pay attention to and for something for down the road uh, that we need to return to rather than move away from. So I would just put that out there as a perhaps a word of caution. I know the hour is very late um, and I just wanted to uh, once again acknowledge all the hard work of the staff and in particular uh, the folks who negotiated this and the leadership uh, from both the House and the Senate, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, and, and all of the folks who put this together, very, very difficult job. I want to acknowledge uh, what a very, very difficult job this is and uh, also thanks again for the members of the committee. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill.
The clerk will close the roll. There being 92 ayes and 40 nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 1068. The clerk will report the bill. House File 1068, the third engrossment, an act relating to capital investment. Representative Hausman, there are some amendments at the desk. Uh, the clerk will report the first amendment. Houseman moves to amend House File 1068, the third engrossment as follows. The amendment is coded DE5. There is also an amendment to the amendment at the desk. The clerk will report that amendment. Representative Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to move that we waive Rule 3.33. Representative Doubt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would encourage members to support that motion. The motion to waive 3.33 on this amendment. All those in favor of the uh, motion say aye. aye. All opposed, no. No motion prevails. Houseman, Houseman moves to, to amend her amendment uh, to House File 1068 as follows. The amendment is coded A35. This is to get the bill in the order the author would like it. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. And on the amendment itself, all those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. Representative, uh, the clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 1068, as amended. Third reading. Representative Hausman. And members, just two quick things on this. This is the bill, uh, the cash bill includes the $22 million for... Uh, Lewis and Clark, and on page 12 of the secondary amendment that we just adopted is some additional language about a water connection in the city of Worthington that's required to sort of get them through this difficult time. And um, in the previous bill was the 20 million public housing, and this one is the uh, 80 million um, uh, pr housing infrastructure bonds, so you get to vote for it twice. Representative Kahn. Mr. Speaker and members of the House, pursuant to the agreement of no amendments, I withdrew uh, um, the amendment I intended to propose. But it's important enough, and I intend to, of course, pursue it in the next session, that I do think I need to speak to it. And this was a uh, language that was proposed to this bill, that was actually in this bill as it passed through capital investment and ways and means that specifically applied to state bonding money which is invested in a nonprofit entity not under government control. And what it does is require a public representative to be added to the board of directors of this, either appointed by the government entity or by the um, uh, bonding or by the bonding authority. What this would do is greatly increase the oversight, uh, the oversight and transparency of the issue and it is uh, and it wasn't to apply to all bonding projects it was only for bonding projects over five million which is uh, remarkably few of the ones and what this would do in giving more um, oversight and transparency and we have received some criticism from some local units of government from the council of nonprofits who I don't believe fully understood the issue but, uh, you know, I'm saying that we should pursue this in future legislative sessions because we should not criticize oversight of public investment in outside entities. It should not be criticized in our age when one of our high values is to seek more transparency and more access. So. Thank you for this opportunity to make this statement, and I hope we'll get on with passing the bill. Any, um, Representative Schumacher. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, I rise tonight in support of the bill in front of us and to talk about the Lewis and Clark Water Project for just a few moments. And I want to have uh, three basic points that I wanted to spread across today from the people of Southwest Minnesota. First is that we are dry. We are dry down in Southwest Minnesota. And we also want to point out that we do have a plan to solve the dryness that we have in our part of the world and we appreciate the support and so we want to pass that along when we talk about how we're dry you, all you have to do is look at the names of the counties in our area rock county pipestone county it, it's very different in that part of the state and that happened several million years ago this isn't a new problem for us this has been something that we've been dealing with for decades now um, since i was about two years old they've been putting together the the plans for lewis and clark in 1990 the board came together and in 2000 the uh, joint powers agreement with the federal government went into place and so we've for a long time been dealing with this and unfortunately the way things went uh, we're having to come to the state today when we're talking about this issue we're not talking about irrigation for for the, the crops in southwest Minnesota, we're talking about drinking water and we're talking about uh, real facility waters for businesses so that they're growing. We're getting reports now back home that businesses are actually cutting back on production and cutting back on staff because there isn't the water supply that they need to produce it. So this is really uh, an economic development point for us as well. So there's really great need and we are dry. But we have a plan to fix all of this and that's the Lewis and Clark plan that we've been pushing through. It's gotten a lot of attention uh, throughout the last, uh, throughout the session. It's a tri-state membership in the southwest corner of Minnesota, uh, South Dakota and Iowa included. That includes 15 cities and five rural water districts. Over 300,000 people will be served by this once it's complete. And basically the uh, problems that we're running into is that as we're pulling that water out of the Missouri River near Vermilion, South Dakota to get water to our districts, we are not getting the, the funding that we need. The original agreement was that the locals put in their share, the state puts in a share, and the feds would cover the rest. The local money came in right away, the state money came in right away, and we're now waiting for the federal dollars to come in. Unfortunately, the way that the federal dollars are coming in at this point is that even with the growth in inflation, the amount of money that comes in and, and, and is appropriated from the federal government won't even keep up with that inflation. And so we're actually moving backwards into the pro process and aren't able to get the water that the people of southwest Minnesota have already paid for. Once it's all connected, once this project is done, we will have more impact than just the two counties that we have here. We'll have uh, close to 10 counties in southwest Minnesota. And we do have uh, assurances from the federal government, the Department of Interior, that these funds, even, if the, even when the state puts forward their funds, that the federal government still has to pay their share of it, that this does not waive their responsibilities. They still are responsible for what they do. And so... Again, we are dry, but we have a plan. And finally, we'll just uh, note that uh, a note of thanks to the legislative leaders on both sides for what they've done to make this possible. I know it's a bit of a hard sell, even though it's water. The feds are supposed to be covering this, and so it took a lot of work to get this across, but people were open to the idea and wanted to be helpful because it is such a, a dire need. The governor was very good to present this in his State of the State address and make this uh, a priority for him along the way. The local leaders were also instrumental in making sure that this kept going. And a very big thanks to the Minnesota taxpayers who have already paid their share of the agreement and are, and are now helping to forward that agreement. The one group of people I would not thank in this is the federal government and the failure that they're having in all of this so that we have to have this here today, an issue that, in my opinion, sucked the air out of a lot of rooms over the last few weeks around here. And so um, I would admonish them while thanking everybody else. And with that, the people of Southwest Minnesota to thank the entire state for the efforts that they give us today. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk. 
We'll close the roll. There being 82 ayes and 50 nays, the bill is passed as amended and as title agreed to. Motions and resolutions. There are copies of the non-controversial motions and resolutions online and at the front desk. If, the, if there's no objection, we'll take those motions first. Hearing no objections, those motions prevail. Announcements. Representative Carlson. Mr. Speaker, uh, members, uh, I'd like you to note a, a time change for the uh, Ways and Means Committee. Uh, we will be meeting at uh, 10 a.m. rather than the originally announced uh, 9 a.m. time, and that will be at room 200. Representative Liebling. Members, the Health and Human Services um, Policy Committee is holding a hearing at 8.30 a.m. Yes, we are in room five at the state office building to hear from the Department of Health on their health equity report. It's an informational hearing. You don't have to vote on anything, but the public is coming. The Department of Health has made arrangements to be there at, uh, seriously, they, they had other places to be, but uh, this is very important to many people to hear about their health equity report, and I hope that you can attend, and non-committee members are certainly welcome. Thank you. Representative, Representative Murphy E. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I move that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 11 a.m. Friday, May 16, 2014. Representative Murphy moves that when the House adjourns today, it uh, adjourns until 11 a.m. Friday, May 16th. May 16th, 2014. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. Representative Doubt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the Majority Leader yield for a question? She will. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Madam Majority Leader, could you outline for us if we'll be caucusing after we come in? We'll recess for caucus. Uh, Mr. Speaker and Representative Doubt, we will come in, uh, uh, begin recess, go to caucus, and then come back and do our work. Thank you. Representative Murphy. I move that the House do now adjourn. Representative Murphy moves that the House do now adjourn. All those in favor of the motion say aye. aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. The House stands adjourned until uh, 11 a.m. Friday, May 16, 2014.